Hello and welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicky, and as always, I'm here with Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Oh, I wanted you to speak exclusively in horns <laughs> for the whole episode. I'm trying to find a new kind of, uh, I don't know, like a like a like a catchphrase or like a, you know, yeah, well, like you'd be like, oh, I'm with Jess and Matt, and Jess always says the same yeah. funny thing. Well, not everyone can have one, um, mm. but isn't it good to be alive? And thanks so much for being here with me today, Dave and Jess. See, he's got one. Dave and Jess. Look, he had Dave and <laughs> Jess. Dave and Jess. Now kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Who, me and Matt or Dave and Jess? Dave and Jess. <laughs> I mean, if Give you... me a kiss. <laughs> hey, you... Oh, it's very wet. You two are sitting right under the block mistletoe. Oh, oh that's right. We are we are rocketing through. This is one of We're blocketing things... through. Come on. Come on, it was Dave. Right Come there. on. It was right there. And I Podcasting appreciate... jokes and mushing words together. <laughs> Thank you. For... And you missed, the, you missed the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you for educating me. We've both just had iced coffees. We're a little excited. <laughs> We're rocketing through block. We're blocketing through rock. Um, whatever. <laughs> this I, I feel this is the most exciting part for a uh, time of year. But it's also a sad time of year for me because it's also this is the last week of block. Yeah, can Blo-vember you believe it? November has blown by, <laughs> as it always does. Quickly, yeah. <laughs> Feels like we're in not Chicago a, or something, huh? Not a, not a slow wind. No, a, a brisk one. Yeah, oh, yeah. yes, mm-hmm. blowing a gale mm-hmm. like Oprah's friend, and Oprah's from Chicago that's at right. some point. God, that's good. That now, good. Matt, do you want to explain for people <laughs> that may have just tuned in for this topic why this is so special this week? Well, block is the most special time of the year. It's the block, blocking us time of the year. Um, yep. And it's the time of the year where we take October, mm-hmm. and now we also take November, mm-hmm. Blocktober and Blovember, mm-hmm. and we count down the most requested <laughs> just and so voted insane. for <laughs> topics of all time. Imagine uh, not is, of all yeah. time, of all year. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, uh, look, welcome, but <laughs> sorry. The show starts soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But it, it is, it's so, uh, thousands of people have voted. We've counted them down the last eight weeks. This is, we had a top nine for, because that's how many weeks in October and November. There are. And this is the Talk number. Talk to Gregory, okay? Don't, <laughs> don't look at me when you're saying that. Gregory, you know, Pius Gregory or oh, whatever his name is. Gregory Weekday. Um. <laughs> of the Gregorian calendar. Gregory calendar. Obviously, it's right there. God, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, this is the most uh, voted for topic this year, so it's a big one. It's a bad one. and uh, oh, oh, it's a bad one. They voted shame. poorly, have they? Yeah, like, oh, wow. Bad is in good. Do you what? understand? Oh, like, like um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like bad is in good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was going to say, like, Michael Jackson. Uh, but then I was like, but that's a bad analogy yeah, because... That's just bad as in bad. Yeah, that's just bad. <laughs> Great. We've established what bad is. Great. Now, this is what good. Is good? <laughs> now, um, the, the way the show works is we usually take it in turns to report on a topic often suggested by one of the listeners. It is my turn this week and we always start with the topic. With a and question. He, here it is. We always start... Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. We've been doing this for seven years. <laughs> this is the messiest start we've had in is ages. Is it seven years? More than, I think. 2015? No, it's seven years. Seven years. Almost. We've just passed our seven-year birthday. Happy birthday, everyone. Happy birthday. Matt, give me a birthday kiss. <laughs> oh, 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 tickled. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I haven't shaved. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> we always start with a question That's to get right. us on the topic. My question is, which blockbuster Toba topic oh, okay. did I visit... In July this year. Okay, okay. where did we? It's in Europe. The then. penis hospital. <laughs> <laughs> was I visiting a patient or was I checking in? You were checking in. It's too big. <laughs> uh, the Virgin Islands. Ooh. Huh? 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 I know you were. You rode a camel eating a pie in Africa. That's right. That was in. Is the topic Morocco. Africa? It's not. Uh, that's a very big topic. Yeah. Well, it's Blocktober. It is. No. Uh, exactly. This is in. The Mount Earth. Vesuvius Volcano? Yes! <laughs> I was going to give you a clue, but you didn't need it. Can didn't I have it. the clue, please? Uh, this is in Italy, mm-hmm. and it's uh, it's near a volcano, Jess. Name, okay. of, name of an ancient city? Pompeii. Pompeii! Damn it! Yes! Is that the same thing? And Mount Vesuvius is the name of this city. So we get a point each. Point each? Dave, I need an I official ruling. Do we get a, the Matt, same. Matt, I'm getting an official ruling. Okay. Do we get a point each? Bing, bing, bing! Yes! That's, That's also no. A point, that was the third one for me. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's points all around. Points for all. That's ah, nice. So, ah, Pompeii and Mount Vesuvius is the same thing. Yes, Pompeii is the city that was covered by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in yeah. 79 AD, and that's what we're talking about this week. 79 AD. That is a very long time ago. Mount Vesuvius exploded all over Pompeii. Like literally, yeah, head to toe. Yep, yep, leaving a lot of people encased in its ejaculate. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you turn your head and regret your jokes privately? Can I just say, at the end of this report, we will discover how Matt is uh, very much getting into the mindset of a Pompeian with that kind of language. Oh, oh. just keep that in the back of your mind. <laughs> okay, I will, but I'm confused. If you see the end of the world coming, what are you doing? You're coming. <laughs> You're coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, so I'm coming. <laughs> I wonder what you would do. I think about that often. Would I just panic or would I just, yeah. Would be at I peace. Just be at peace. Would I, I don't know, finish an episode of something on Netflix? Like, I feel oh. like, yeah, If you, I feel like I'd attempt to run or get out. Yeah. You but just go for a run. <laughs> yeah. Go for a run. You know. One last run before heaven. <laughs> I want to leave behind a... <laughs> I'll run before I fly. A svelte corpse. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Right. I've really put on a couple of kilos. <laughs> now, so I, I went to uh, Pompeii in, in July. I visited the city. Fantastic. I wanted to go there and get a photo and have a pie and ha- caption it. More like pom pie. Oh, that's good stuff. But they didn't have any pies available. That's why you are the pun master. So it's very disappointing. Why don't you BYO pie? I should. you got to start BYO pieing, Dave. B-Y-O-P-P, the second piece of typo. <laughs> so there was no Pompeii, but it was a fantastic visit, and I'll talk a bit about that. But um, Hang this- on, does that also mean that your entire six-week trip was tax deductible now? Oh, yes, absolutely. Here I am, research. Yeah. And then I had to go to Morocco, to, Morocco to do further research. You also did a live podcast, like literally doing all... Yeah, that, okay, you're writing all that so off, So we've topped and tailed with work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. This is all research. Yeah, you've nailed that. Uh, Unless the tax man's listening. How well was that timed, though? Because you, um, mm. you didn't know any of the block topics, were, what were coming up. No, we just divvy them up in the order that the, they, they come up and the fact that I've been given it. I've actually tried to put it up for the vote twice this year, Pompeii. Really? Both times it lost. The second time was one of those second chance. You know, yeah, yeah. For people at home, our Patreon supporters often vote for our topics. I put three up. It came second. And I said, I'll give it a second chance. It came second again. And now here it is as the most voted for topic of block. Wow. That's amazing. So there you go. But I think because it's a slightly different kind of vote. In the norm- our normal votes, you can only vote for one topic. But this one, you can vote for all the topics you want to hear. So I think it, it just gives it a different result in the end. It'd be too brutal otherwise. I think there's over 100 options. Yeah, you just pick picking one. Pick yeah. one. Oof, too much stress. Uh, this topic has been suggested by a bunch of people and you can do the suggested topic anytime through our website. Uh, thank you to Bree Finlay, Lucy Smith, Devin Bruns, Chris Beaumont, Amy from the Philippines and Lisa Honeyford who suggested four topics within a 28-minute period in October 2018, and we've now done three of them. Whoa. Wow. So great work, Lisa. That's a hot hand she had there. The Dancing Plague, Tarara who ate everything, and now Pompeii and Mount Vesuvius. What will the fourth and final one be, Lisa? Well, you surely know what I do it know. is. And she, it sounds like she suggests good topics. Yeah, yeah very well good done, topics. Lisa. I hope you're still listening. hope you haven't given up on us. Hey, Dave, <laughs> you, you totally lied to the audience just before, though. Obviously, you said that this just happened to fall to you, the number one topic, but we purposely switched the order around so you could do it because you begged us. You said, if Vesuvius ever comes up, I want it. I've been there. Give it to me. People aren't going to look at this order and say, oh, it's weird that Dave did two reports in three weeks and not get it. You dog. Then why did you set me up before and say, oh, it's amazing that this topic fell to you? <laughs> <laughs> you fucking you idiot. Start- Butted your own point. Well, <laughs> I'd say edit that bit out then, Dave. <laughs> Keep the magic alive. Usually we never know what the topics are. Just no, with, block with it's block. a bit harder. But um, yeah, that's uh, normally I think the block questions are normally not the topic because it's like now I've got to pretend I don't know the answer. Yeah. And I'm not good at pretending. I'm no, a bad liar. You're a terrible liar. <laughs> you're a terrible person. Yeah, as we <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Okay, let's talk Pompeii. Do you okay. guys know much about it? Have you been? You've been there. You've both been to Italy. I've been to Italy. I haven't been to Pompeii. I've been to 
Milano for <laughs> half a day and okay. uh, I went to the McDonald's and uh, no, no Irish I, bar there. No, I was just there, for just a, a change, a quick changeover on right. a train trip or something. That's the only Italy I've ever seen. Oh, oh okay. really? Ah, huh. well, I've done Rome, Venice. Pisa. See, this is your generation else, to a T. I've done Rome. I've done <laughs> mm-hmm. just just items on a list to you. Yeah. Whereas I experienced Milano mm. via the McDonald's. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm, how do they do a junior burger here? Mm. Oh, slightly differently. Oh. Mm. <laughs> and then I tick it off my list. <laughs> And I get back on a train. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the site of the ancient city of Pompeii is found near modern-day Naples in the Campania region of Italy. It began life as a small coastal settlement which covered about 10 hectares. It wasn't too big at the start, but by the 6th century BC, the town had expanded to more than six times its original size, and it only continued to grow when it fell under the Roman Empire around the 1st century BCE. Latin became the official language, and a Roman constitution was imposed on the new colony. And wealthy Romans desired living in the Bay of Naples, which was extremely prosperous due to its fertile agricultural land but why oh why was the land so fertile i guess they'll never find <laughs> out so so volcanic earth is particularly fertile very fertile right. and even that to this day that region is famous for tomatoes and beautiful ah. fruits and vegetables what mm. region did you say it was campania campania so that's famous for tomatoes and stuff so maybe like if i go home tonight and have a look at my cupboard crushed tomato can mm-hmm. if i have a look Campania is probably on the label. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100% yeah, yeah. locked in. Nowhere else grows them. Uh, no, and uh, yeah, they'll all be from Campania. Campania. Yep. But it's very, very fertile. They grow beautiful fruits and vegetables there. Yeah. They probably don't even put them in cans, though. That's how good they would be. You yeah, don't that, need to can them. No, oh. that's just like spitting on a tomato. <laughs> yeah. Like people who refrigerate their tomatoes. Remember my, my nana once said to me, gets rid of all the flavor. Refrigerating a tomato. Yeah, don't refrigerate the tomato. Oh, you lose all the flavour. Oh, well, what if some of us like flat, flavourless tomatoes? <laughs> well, obviously, you refrigerate everything, Dave. Yeah, exactly. I don't like to taste my meal. Can we blend that up? Get it in some sort of a slop? <laughs> tomato slop in a can from Campania. <laughs> so it became a very wealthy and sophisticated place to live. Ooh. As in any growing place, it began to gentrify. And houses were subdivided and upper stories added to make room for the newcomers. So it was, it was it was a boom in time. Cool. Now a bustling town, it was home to about ten to twelve thousand people, with as many again living in the surrounding countryside. Bars and restaurants lined the streets, and shopping in the city was apparently world class. Oh, ah, I wonder if they had like a Tiffany's. Collins Street type <laughs> set up. Do they, will they have Jimmy Choo? Oh, of course. Mm. Did Harry they have Winston. Coco Chanel. Did they have Coco Chanel? <laughs> Chanel. Yeah. That would be a pretty good uh, name for a nail salon. Yeah. Because they're always puns. So Coco Chanel would be pretty funny, actually. <laughs> I I copyright that one. Nah, it probably already exists. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's too good to not exist. Chanel. <laughs> Coco Chanel. Coco Chanel. They're yeah. honestly always punny and it's always lame. So Coco Chanel isn't that bad. There's a few industries that do that. Hair, Th- thai, thai food. Yes. It's always, there's a lot of Thai puns. Uh, and pho as well, even though I yeah. think pho is not even pronounced like that, but it's like photo is one uh, around yep. nearby to here. I think on Sydney Road, there's a photo. But it should be like photo. Yeah. And that is different, isn't it? That's why language is beautiful to me. Hairdressers do it a bit. Nail salons do it a bit. What's a good hairdresser's one? Um, snip, snip. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which is, and that's, what's that playing on? Scissors. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think you misunderstand puns more than me. <laughs> what are the, what are the, what? Oh, you know what I am very good at? Improv. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you're playing with a heavyweight here. I did, I did two uh, semesters. Yeah, that's so, right. You know, and that probably still shines through. Snip, snip. I think that's good. Personally, I'd go there. <laughs> About ten years ago, I used to listen to a, a podcast of the Dave Gorman radio show, and they had they were obsessed with pun names for places, and there was a hairdresser's uh, called. Uh, Salon Le Bon, which, it, which I did not get that to explain. It was a pun on the Duran Duran singer, Simon, Simon Le, Le Bon. bon. <laughs> Salon Le Bon. <laughs> that so, does need to good. be explained. I'm like, this must be a pun in French or yeah, something. Yeah. No. 
So good. That That's doesn't good. work, I don't think. Salon Le bon. Salon's not close enough to Simon no, to work. No, at all. I like it. The sound that's more like what your you do for puns in the the Patreon shout out bit later on. That's right. But more like Pompeii, that's pretty good. That's good. Come on. Yeah, and you're setting it up as well. You're saying Pompeii more like Pompeii. Yeah, yeah. Out of context, maybe people would be like, What's that referring to? Like if I call my pie shop Pompeii. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> confusing so it's a it's a world-class shopping lots of uh, places to eat and drink it's also very advanced using roman aqueduct technology the city was supplied with fresh water flowing from the hills over 40 kilometers away oh wow this is 2000 years ago to quote from the western australian museum which in 2010 had an exhibit on pompeii this water flowed into a roofed reservoir before dividing into three large lead pipes which ran under the pavements Six meter high towers with lead tanks. Again, lead's not great, but anyway, on top were built at intervals along these three pipelines. The 35 meter height difference between the castellum, which is the uh, name of the tank, and the lowest point in the city meant that the water in the pipes was under pressure, allowing smaller pipes to carry water up to the tanks, then wow. back down to the towers to supply public fountains, houses, shops, and facilities like baths. It sounds like heaven. Got- At first, I'm like, take me back. And now I'm like, ah, oh, but my phone. Mm. Mm. How know? would you stay in touch with people? How would I stay in touch with people? Well, my next sentence, they also had phones. Oh, <laughs> do they have Nintendo Switches? Yes. Can I play my little bear and back for I'm afraid game? That's, that game hasn't come out oh! yet. Back then. Yeah, that comes out the next year. Sorry. I have to wait. Yeah, You have, you have to wait, wait through an eruption. Oh. But what have I told Spoilers. you? That they do have toilets. Okay. While decidedly rare in other parts of the world at this time, toilets were commonplace in the sophisticated Pompeii city and often occupied a small room off the kitchen. Off the kitchen. Off the kitchen. Yeah, I don't think they say occupied, they say occupied. Do you want to shit next to the kitchen? Well, you never, a gentleman never shits, but do no. you want to piss right next to the kitchen? I Well, no, I, and I think there's there's rule regulations about you can't have a, a toilet off a kitchen. At least here in Australia. I don't know what they're doing in Pompeii. Yeah, but. true. Obviously <laughs> different rules. We still want to tell that to whoever built my house. Anyway, uh, <laughs> bathing was a popular public activity and Pompeii boasted three public baths. Oh. Beautiful. The city also boasted advanced use of medicine with doctors and surgeons. The Roman medical system was so advanced that some say it remained unsurpassed until the 19th century. Wow. Pretty amazing. That is amazing. The city also claimed world-class entertainment. Oh, my God. Have they got a Tina Arena? Ricky Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I was already improv You don't have to improv over the top of me improv No, that's not me doing over the top. That's me <laughs> thinking at the same time as you, but you just your mind works quicker. <laughs> so it can't, you say it about five, ten minutes earlier than me. <laughs> Yeah, like Something said, not in, good. In about <laughs> half an hour, Matt will just say, Ricky Martin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good, mate. It's well, tough. that's genuinely, I think we were both going, <laughs> aiming for the same pause there. You just got to it so long before me. <laughs> well, they didn't have a Tina Arena, but they did have a Tina. Ricky Martin. <laughs> they did have a Tina Amphitheater. Oh. Uh, no relation. It's the oldest known amphitheater in the Roman world. Actually was called there. Tina? Yeah. Oh, my God. Can you, can you imagine? I and, nailed that. And is it is it true? Have you you've seen Bronwyn Cuss's bit about Tina Arena's real name is Tina Pina? Oh no, I didn't. I haven't seen that bit. I've never looked up to see if it's true. It's a very funny bit. <laughs> no, well, no doubt Bronwyn Cuss, very funny comedian. Yes, Tina Pina. <laughs> That's funny. Again, from the WA Museum, the contests Pompeians enjoyed were ultraviolet, ultraviolent, even by today's standards. <laughs> oh, that's so different. <laughs> <laughs> But I love that. Even by today's standards, it's like, yeah, these people fought to the death. Yeah. What by today's standards? What violence are we doing like that? Yeah, that's right. I get, ours is more macro violence. <laughs> yeah. Death from above and stuff. Back then, they at least killed people face to face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All about microaggressions and macro violence. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it got quite rowdy in the amphitheater. And our micro violence uh, these days is even bad, you know, for Roman times. Yeah. Back then, people would say stuff like, huh, you're wearing that today. Yeah. And now? Is that a micro violence? And now what would we say? Now we'd say, huh. You're wearing yeah. fucking that today. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting choice. <laughs> Matching that eyeliner with that <laughs> blouse. That hurts. Matt knows so much about fashion. 
It really does. Um, Are people still wearing blouses? <laughs> of course. Blouses will always be in. Violent, you were saying. Got rowdy. He got rowdy in the stands. And uh, one time there was a riot afterwards. And then uh, to, to show them all, the emperor went, okay, fine. I'm closing down the amphitheater for 10 years. <gasps> now nobody gets an amphitheater. Yeah. Are you happy? Cop it. Wow, that's a big... 10 years, I know. Dad's angry. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's it. I'm going to turn this amphitheater around. No, Dad. <laughs> Please, Dad. We love watching gladiators fight animals. Our gladiators were very popular amongst all of society. Both men and women idolized the fighters who were often foreign slaves. One piece of surviving graffiti in Pompeii reads, Saladus, the Thracian, makes all the girls sigh. <laughs> that is so good. Now, what Jeez, are they sighing about? we haven't changed about? at all. <laughs> 2,000 years ago. What are they sighing about? Maybe he's really dull. Maybe he says really problematic things and all the women go, "Ah." have you thought about that? Saladus, the Thracian, shut the fuck up. Because I've never seen a a man so attractive that I've sighed. Well, yeah, I haven't seen Saladus, Thracian. But I wouldn't sigh. I'd go, (laughs) ah, I'd gasp. Hubba, hubba. (laughs) That's written, Saladus, the Thracian, makes all the girls go, (laughs) ah, So I might have, you know, language is always evolving. Sai so back then might mean aruga now. <laughs> we don't know. I love how all of us have done that very differently. It's very fun to do that. If you put like a uh, sigh into Google Translate yeah. from Italian to English, you, it does give you aruga. <laughs> so I wish I could roll R's like Jess did. I didn't roll R's. Dave rolled R's. Aruga! Yeah, he, I can't roll them like I that. I get you too confused. Well, I know. I went for that sort of like grunt yeah, that always guttural. makes you laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful sound. <laughs> Beautiful sound. Our delicate lady. <laughs> Satisfying. <laughs> Love to hear it right in my ears. We're in these headphones. Ooh. Ooh. You know what? That's, when you do that sound, it makes me think. <sighs> <laughs> well, it did hurt my throat a little bit, so I'm just going to have a little break. Worth it. So I'm trying to paint a picture of this city, though. So it's it's very, very advanced for the time, especially, and would remain that way uh, on any scale for a long time. In terms Isn't that of advanced wild orders. that it was until the, did you say till the 19th century? Yeah, for medicine, yeah. That's so cool. I love that our century, our couple of centuries have really taken the world forward. And mm. I think that was us, mm-hmm. you know, collectively. The modern Romans. We've been around for most of that time. That's so. right. I've so seen a lot of that stuff being done. I'm just a little baby. Yeah. So I haven't I haven't had much of an opportunity to make an impact. Maybe hey, you've played your part. Oh, well, I've tried. Dave had a medical condition named after him. If I'm remembering that anecdote correctly, I'm not. I'm guessing. <laughs> uh, which one? No, that was someone else. All right. <laughs> how many people are you podcasting with? Oh my god, that's a very personal question. This is how we find out. Yeah, hang on a second. I don't really do uh, body counts, Jess. Oh. I think they're a bit. I think they're a bit uncouth. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> Potty counts. Potty counts. <laughs> <laughs> Pun King is back. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's debate as to how many people lived there in 79 AD, the year in, in question, but most historians estimate it's about 20,000 people. Yeah, right. That's a decent sized town. Yeah. And nearby to Pompeii was the smaller town of Herculaneum. It had. Oh my God. <laughs> that was pretty awesome, isn't it? Holy shit. Herculaneum. It had about 5,000 residents. <laughs> Hydrogen, helium, herculaneum. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound like the strongest metal ever discovered. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. Sorry. We were interrupting a lot. I'm going to pipe down. It had, it had 5,000 residents. So it's a bit smaller, but it grew to become a holiday resort and luxurious retreat oh. for the wealthy landowners who built and bought estates there. So it's much more wealthy. It's very exclusive. Okay. little enclave. Sounds the, like where I'd want to live. I think you would. <laughs> the largest villa known as the Villa of Papyri is widely believed to have been owned by Julius Caesar's father-in-law, who I only bring up because he's got an incredible name, which is Lucius Calpurnius Piso Caesoninus. That is a beautiful name for a boy or girl. <laughs> I'm going to need that one more time. Lucius mm-hmm. Calpurnius mm-hmm. Piso mm-hmm. Caesoninus. Mm-hmm. Oh, that is good. What would his nickname be? Nina's the penis, sure. <laughs> yeah. People, you know. Yeah. Back then. They hear what they want to hear. They heard Nina's the penis. <laughs> uh, there's also a couple of other places nearby, including Stabier and... What? <laughs> Stabier. It's a fancy place to get stabbed. Yeah. <laughs> That's the nickname of uh, Cork or Limerick. I always get, I forget. One of the, Stab City in Ireland. Right. 
You can never remember. I can which never one. remember which one it is. And the people from the other city, I imagine, don't appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Stabier and also Torre Annunziata are the two other places nearby. Okay. And they all had one thing in common. They were overlooked by a giant. Oh. I'm actually I'm talking about Mount Vesuvius, but in oh. fact, in Greek <laughs> and Roman mythology, giants were said to have been defeated and then buried under mountains, where their tormented shivers were said to cause earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Oh wow! So you could say it's a giant, yeah. That's oh, sick. That's, I kind of like that. We defeated the giants, but they haunt us. Yeah, <laughs> they fuck us up every few years. Every, every few time years. they shiver, <laughs> tormentedly. We got to rebuild. God, these fucking yeah, these giants. These fucking giants, even after death, giving us grief. Jeez Louise. <laughs> Mount Vesuvius does really loom over the whole area, though. And even today, when driving down the highway, you can see it from miles and miles away. You're like, holy shit, there it is. And it really looks like the, a cartoon of a volcano. Right. It's like what you're imagining. It's like, bang, there it is. Wow. Got a bit of steam coming out the big hole in the middle. May as well. Yeah. Pomp. That's, that's a no. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But we can talk about why that's important. Oh. Okay. Hey, Dave, is Pompeii, is, is that where Pompus comes from? Any relation there? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that comes from Pompey the Great, maybe. Pompous meaning. Pompey the Great. Jeez, you can throw anything at Dave and he'll have have an answer. Thank you for never doing that to me. (laughs) Even if you were like, hey, Jess, what is your middle name? I'd be like, oh, I'm frazzled. (laughs) Can you ask Dave? Uh, Snip, snip. (laughs) Snip, snip. (laughs) Jess, snip, snip Perkins. (laughs) Oh, that could overtake Bop, I reckon. No. Snip, snip. No. I've had Bop personalised on so many things. Jess, I can't start again. You know the only way to ensure a new nickname is to deny yeah, it. Yeah, you're right. I love it. Call me Snip Snip, everybody. All right, Snip Snip. No! <laughs> Call me Simon LeBon. <laughs> That's a great name. What a great name. Now, Pompous, I'm looking up, it's late Middle English, so not from here, from this period of time, from Old French Pompo, which means full of grandeur. Oh, uh, yes. That's nice. And from late Latin, pompous from pompa or pomp. <laughs> there you go. See, I love the word, though, pompous. It's fantastic. Mm. Pomp, all of that is great. So fun. Great fun there. Great fun. <laughs> so Pompeii was located just five miles away from Mount Vesuvius, and by AD 79, it hadn't erupted in four centuries, which is quite a long time, and the longer the time between eruptions, the more catastrophic the eventual eruption will be. So that's why it's important. Steam's that not- volcano's got blue balls. Yeah. <laughs> so if steam was coming out, that would actually be good because it would be venting a bit. Right. Oh, yeah. Having a wank. But it's, it's, it ain't wanking. It's not- wet dreams. <laughs> the giant's having a wet dream. <laughs> the chastity belt is padlocked on at this point. I'm so sorry. Mm. My parents listen to this podcast. Do they really? Sorry, guys. It's a bit funny, though. <laughs> So it hasn't gone off, so to speak, in four centuries. So to speak. They had no idea, but they were living directly underneath a ticking time bomb. Oh, no. Mm. Now, two of the most famous people connected to Pompeii and Vesuvius are two people who are also very well known in their own time in the Roman world, Pliny the Elder and Pliny the Younger. Oh, yep. That makes sense. No relation. Are these? No, they they are. They are related. (laughs) They they love that younger and elder thing in the olden days. They didn't have as many names, so you right. sort of had to name your kid after yourself. And it's a bit like senior and junior now. Yeah. You know, we've just made it way cooler. Yeah, yeah. Senior the younger, junior, the older. Cooler. And the older is a bit hurtful too, because they had kids younger back then as well. So you're like, what, I'm 20 and I'm the elder? Come, Come on. on. I got Come my whole on. life ahead of me. <laughs> That's, yeah, a, that's got on like, you for naming your kid after yourself, though. Yeah, true. I've got my whole life ahead of me. I've got like seven or eight years I've left. Got seven or eight good years left. <laughs> and then I'll die of old age. <laughs> With dignity. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Pliny, but it's, a, it's also even worse, I think, though, when you're Pliny the Younger, the, your whole life you've been the Younger, but when you're an old man, they're still calling you the Younger. It's like you with Master. Take me seriously, Bank. Dave, for those who don't know. Still the has credit a card. card still says Master instead of Mister, and he's tried so hard to get him to change it. <laughs> they refuse. They say, little boy, get your mother to call us back. <laughs> your Dolomites account is doing very well. <laughs> Aren't you a good little saver? <laughs> so Pliny the Elder was a Roman author, naturalist, natural philosopher, as well as a naval and army commander. Does naturalist mean he goes nude? Yeah. He's a nudist. <laughs> yeah. Never wore pants, this man. <laughs> I he, get it. Pliny, Pliny the Elder, and he called his... Uh, Don't do it. Okay. <laughs> nah, go on. He called his... Well, you know, he's always out and about, and he called Pliny... The, 
plenty of the plenty of the smaller or something. I don't know. So you had nowhere to go. You didn't know where you were going with it. No. So it was, I almost helped you by saying, "Yeah, don't I, do it. I said thank I'm you very much." I'm sorry for making you do it. Then Dave will edit around that and make it <laughs> tidy that up a bit. Yep. Where did you think I was going when you said don't go there? Penis. Yeah. Yeah. We knew you, you were naming the Wang. <laughs> it was very clear <laughs> you were going to name a penis. <laughs> yeah. I just think if you, I think it's a beautiful naming. Uh, what do you call that naming thing? Convention. Convention. Thank you. I think it's a, yeah. I think it's a, an honor that all all young men uh, they get to a certain age and they get to name their penis. Yeah, they get to know, well, they, <laughs> naming but, days. <laughs> but if you're you're you know you get to call everything just plenty the you know call your hand plenty the fingers plenty the finger finger holder. I don't mind that plenty uh, the finger. Plenty the plenty the toe. Yeah, that, plenty that the was the toe. nickname of his penis. Plenty the knee. Not good. Oh, the toe. Yeah, plenty oh, the boy. toe. Big toe, little toe. Little toe. Oh, the knee boy. would be plenty the plenty the leg bendy. Okay, mine was better. Plenty the knee, but okay. I mean, it's a knee though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dave. I haven't thought about it like that. Dave. Dave, edit that bit. Dave. Do go on. Off. Dave. Do go on. The BBC describes Pliny the Elder as possibly the most well-informed living Roman on matters of natural science. His 37-volume Natural History is the longest work on science in Latin that has survived from antiquity. And in, is described by Britannica with semi praise. <laughs> Natural history, an encyclopedic work of uneven accuracy that was an authority on scientific matters up to the Middle Ages. <laughs> uneven accuracy. But that, I mean, to even be accurate a bit back then. Yes, this is 2,000 years ago. Yeah, when they're thinking that giants are buried under mountains and yeah. stuff. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it's not bad. It's pretty good. In the 37 volumes, he had a crack at astronomy, zoology, botany, agriculture, medicine, minerals, and geography. Whoa. He was a very influential writer, although he didn't get everything right. He believed heavily in magic and superstition, and this helped shape scientific and medical theory in subsequent centuries, for better or worse. Right. He was a... (laughs) You gotta go to your GP, and they're like, have you tried magic? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Have no. you contacted a warlock about this? <laughs> take, yeah, take a couple of hours of new and uh, have a bit of rest. Definitely had medical experiences worse than that. Like when I went in with a, like I was getting like a, a reaction where I was getting like boils on my skin and I went to the doctor and he goes, what do you think it is? Oh my God, I've had a doctor do <laughs> what that. What do you mean? My, the childhood doctor I went to for a very long time when I started getting migraines uh, I, like I'd seen him, we did some tests. I came back two days later and he was like, what can I help you with? And I was like, it's been two days. Look at your chart. And then he had a look at the chart and then went, hmm, well, so what should we do? And I was like, I don't know, Rex. I'll come to you, mate. That's why I'm here. I like it. You dropped the doctor at that point. Yeah. It's like, you're just Rex. His name's Rex. You're just some yeah, guy. Exactly. You've taken back it. Far out. Don't see him anymore. This, this guy end, end, ended my uh, $70 consultation by saying, oh, hang on. Got onto his computer, started typing, saying, how do you spell it? How do you spell it? And then he wrote down on a, a post-it note and slid it across the desk. And all it said on it was Zyrtec. Good. <laughs> the antihistamine brand. How do you spell it? How do you spell, spell it? it? And uh, yeah. Like that, it sounds, actually. Paid that man $70. Good. Was that helpful? Does Zyrtec help with the skin irritation? Yeah. It's fun Quite to know that we're basically all doctors already. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. I can remember an ad. <laughs> Oh, I can do that too. I can almost remember almost that. Remember that yeah. <laughs> I might be overqualified for this one. <laughs> so, so Pliny had uh, some theories. One was he was a big proponent of the doctrine of signatures, which I'd never heard of, but it's the belief that plants display characteristics or signatures such as color, shape, or a common name that are indicative of the disease that they can cure. Oh. The idea that God or a higher being has given us clues as to what stuff can help our bodies with. A common name. God gave us all the, yeah. all the names. <laughs> no. And the, this belief was actually widespread throughout many cultures in the world for a long, long time. Some examples include walnuts, which were considered to be shaped a bit like the human brain. Maybe they could help with brain disease. Blood root. They also look like testes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brain disease. Brain disease. <laughs> <laughs> Your ball brain. Yeah, lower brain. <laughs> As upper brain, this brain the elder. Pl- Plithy the lower. <laughs> That's what I should have said before. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Damn it. It's good to workshop these things. Plithy? Plithy, Plithy, the, Plithy, Plithy the, the lower. lower. That's what I call my balls. Plithy. Plithy. <laughs> what, what was his, his name? His name is Pliny. <laughs> Pliny. Plithy the lower. Pliny the dangling. 
Uh, some other examples of the doctrine of signatures include blood root, which is has a red es- extract, was theorized it could fix problems with blood. Or rooting. Yeah, maybe. The plant saxifrage. Oh, right. Saxophones. saxophones. <laughs> <laughs> and Brenda Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> no, it breaks apart rocks as it grows. Okay. Because it's like a plant that breaks through rocks. So they thought it could Broken cure, bone. help. It could help kidney stones. Oh, yeah. Break yep. them apart. Gotta break them down. The the herb called Elkanet has a viper shaped seed, so they thought that could penis. treat snake bites. Damn it! <laughs> they could help penis. <laughs> or this Hello, one. Hello, doctor. I have a sick penis. <laughs> <laughs> well, they might give you ginseng root, which was used to assist male sexual vitality due to its resemblance to the male reproductive anatomy. Are you kidding me? I just said penis for the other one, and you couldn't have said just hang on one go have a guess of this one. You couldn't let me have a guess of that one when I just yelled penis. Come on. I mean, let honest, just yell penis again. For the last 368 Dave. episodes, you've just yelled penis over and over again. Yeah, that's true. I'm a delight to work with. Uh, ginseng root is still used today, though. Penis. Yeah? Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Uh, today, the doctrine of signatures is considered to be pseudoscience and has led to many deaths and severe illnesses. Oh, mm. boy. Whoops, anyway. Still I, I, pseudoscience. Hasn't been fully taken off the science. Yeah, <laughs> science is still in there, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Makes you think. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So obviously it wasn't too far off the mark there. Plenty. Plithy. Oh, fuck. <laughs> no, you're right. Okay. I, I, just fucking with you. Anyway, I, I just found that interesting. Interesting. I don't want to paint Plenty the Elder to be a complete quack. He wasn't. He was one of the most educated people of his day. Yeah. Unlike many of the sources, his writings were based on his work survived and became sort of a default text and wasn't properly challenged for about 1,500 years. Wow. So good on you, Pliny. That's pretty good. Pliny also held a number of positions of influence in Rome. His last assignment was that of commander of the fleet. And he was also a social media influencer. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He was commander of the fleet in the Bay of Naples, where he was charged with the suppression of piracy. Oh. The Bay of Naples is very close to Pompeii, and his job would mean that he would be very nearby on that fateful day. Oh. Now, was he the elder or the younger or the dangling? That's the elder. <laughs> the younger slash dangling is his nephew, oh. Pliny the Younger. Oh. oh, Not even his son. But he was adopted by Pliny the Elder. Ah. He grew to be famous and influential in his own right, becoming a lawyer, author, and magistrate holding many positions of power, including consul and head of the military and senatorial treasuries. How are you doing all those things? Hope he was a lawyer and magistrate at the same time. Mm, I'll allow it. (laughs) Objection. (laughs) Overruled. What? (laughs) I (laughs) mean. Fuck you. (laughs) Sustained. Sustained. Well, that's slanderous. (laughs) It's important that I show impartiality. (laughs) That's right. Don't make me throw you out, Pliny. (laughs) Many of the letters he wrote survive, including to emperors and historians like Tacitus, who give us a snapshot of Rome at the time, including a certain fateful day in Pompeii in AD 79. Did you say 1879? AD 79. Oh, AD 79. I'm like, whoa. (laughs) (laughs) The Roman Empire was around much more recent than I (laughs) realised. No, it's it's a long, long time ago. And because that's one of the reasons there's debate to this day as to whether the eruption happened in August, as recalled by Pliny the Younger, or in October, based on the fact that fresh pomegranates and olives were found in houses in Pompeii, and seasonally, for that to be possible, it would have to be, it's more likely to have been later in the year. Did you say August or October? Yeah. No, not September, though. Well, Pliny says August, and then science says October. And then how how was fresh fruit found? How was it found? Yeah. Uh, from seeds and the like. Okay. Because, remarkably, it's been very well preserved, as we'll talk about. <laughs> but we do know it was AD 79. Okay. That's one. That's that's important. During the period leading up to the eruption, there had been many telltale signs of what was to come. For days, the region had been rocked by tremors, but the townsfolk carried on with their lives as small earthquakes were common across the Campania region. They were only concerned by large earthquakes that happened from time to time, including... 17 years earlier in 62 AD, when Pompeii was rocked by a seismic activity that almost destroyed the entire town. Right. And cool. there's evidence that they were still rebuilding stuff when the volcano erupted 17 years later. Is it possible? I know this is this will help prove my delayed brain thing. But, you know, we're talking about October and August. Here we go. I thought you were going to say because... Um, Ricky Martin. <laughs> 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 because October is, oct- is the 8th, which got bumped back. Right, because of some cha- some pope or someone added a couple more months in. 
So August is actually the eighth month. So I thought I thought you were gonna say it was some confusion about uh, it being the eighth month. No, I think it's mostly because of bad handwriting. They think. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Probably Rex scribbled down <laughs> something. Know. Honestly, I think your your theory there is too intelligent. That's too smart. That's too smart. Yeah. It's bad handwriting or the fact that, as we'll talk about, Pliny described the events 25 years later. Right. So his mind might have just been a little bit off. Right. Because he was alive for 25 more Holy years. Holy shit. Which is like a, a person's entire lifetime. Yeah. yeah, well, he was a baby at the time. It's like living <laughs> to 200 now. <laughs> his memories of a baby. So then I started crying. Yeah, I normally did that around... Oh, uh, August? August? <laughs> <laughs> or was it October that I cried? Mm. I can't remember. Was, did, so, I t- quite, did I cry twice that year? <laughs> <laughs> now, so in the days before the eruption, there's lots of earthquakes going on. Small tr- light tremors, but they're ignoring them. Life is normal. Who cares? This they happens happen, a lot. whatever. Yep. Now, educated Romans knew what volcanoes were, and Pliny the Elder had written about lava flows in Mount Etna in Sicily. But most Pompeians had no idea what was going on underneath the earth beneath their feet. But now, thanks to modern science, we do. Mm. I didn't giants. In fact, I knew so little about volcanoes. I didn't even know the word volcano is derived from the name of Volcano, which is V U L C A N O, a volcanic island in the Aeolian Islands off of Italy, whose name in turn comes from Vulcan. The god of fire in Roman mythology. Holy ah. shit! And Vulcan was my favorite gladiator. Yes. It all comes back around. I preferred Tower, but Vulcan was still pretty cool. <laughs> Tower's great. Delta is probably my other favorite. Yeah. <laughs> Taipan. Taipan, pretty good. Good stuff. They're all great. Let's be honest. But Russell yeah. Crow, as well. <laughs> but Volcano is an island that has a big, like, very stereotypical looking volcano on oh. as well. So it's named after that. But this didn't come into use until the 1600s. So a long time after the eruption in 79 AD. So they didn't have a word. They just volcano. used to be angry mountains or something. Yeah. They'd seen lava and been like, oh, I guess that's to do with the giants underneath it. Mm-hmm. What they also didn't realize is underneath the volcano is a magma chamber filled with molten rock. Some volcanologists estimate the tank of molten rock underneath Vesuvius to be three kilometers deep and five kilometers in diameter. It fills up over time and causes earthquakes and heats the local groundwater. Over time, the ground above the tanks split and a thin column of magma makes its way to the surface via a small fissure or a crack. That's, Whoa. It's sort of releasing a bit of the energy. Usually... Pre-cum. Yes. <laughs> usually, thanks for putting it into understandable terms. Usually it leaks out slowly in the form of a lava flow. <laughs> You don't want it leaking out slowly. <laughs> you want it leaking out fast? I don't know. Oh, the tank underneath is overflowing and a, and a bit just flows out. It releases it releases the chamber, you know? Mm-hmm. Every now and then you got to let it go. But in 79 AD, the magma couldn't make its way to the surface to vent because it was covered by dense rock formations that trapped it all inside. The pressure of the gases created by the magma built up underneath the rocks for hundreds of years until it could no longer hold. Someone it, lightly touched the giant's leg. Yeah. Oh, nope, stop. Oh, oh, my God. Oh, dear Lord. Oh, there's going to be an eruption. Oh, 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 imagine you! Imagine the giant does that, and all of a sudden he's coming, thinking about dead puppies and grandma. Oh, <laughs> that's going to lead to issues down the track. <laughs> so eventually, after hundreds of years, it could no longer hold, and eventually, <laughs> it cracked. That's so not th- a bad wait. Yeah, it's pretty good. How long? Hundred, four hundred years. Four hundred years. years. Eventually, it cracked through the cone of the volcano. Talk about edging. Yeah. Now this type of eruption is. It's, it's ultimate edging because it's only seen every two to 5,000 years and it's much, much more destructive. In this case, this was Vesuvius's biggest eruption for 2,000 years. Wow. But the Romans had no idea about this and they had no idea that in many ways this was history repeating itself because in 2001, archaeologists unearthed remnants of a Bronze Age village just 25 kilometers from Pompeii in Nola. Oh, wow. Which had been abandoned after Vesuvius's eruption 2,000 years before the 79 AD eruption. So this was... 
So this whole area had a history of settlements being taken out by the volcano, being buried, totally forgotten about, and then new people would come go, along. Wow, and go, how rich is this soil? Yeah, the f- soil's so fertile here. We should wow. live here. What, right. Fantastic. So, Why aren't people already yeah, living so here? Weird. No one's claimed this land. It, it's it's great. It feels like it's like nature setting a trap, <laughs> yeah. you know, like a Venus flytrap or something. Yeah. Hey, come in here. And come they in. wouldn't know that it's so fertile because of the repeated eruptions and then history would repeat itself and then it would just, things would just get buried and it would it's start just, again. That's just the earth just eating humans, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Reclaiming them. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> so in 79 AD, it all came to a head, so to speak. It erupted and molten rock that was previously trapped shot into the air with incredible force and then fragmented and cooled into billions of fragments of dust and pumice. The cloud above the volcano quickly reached kilometers into the air. 10,000 tons of material was ejected every second. Wow. So it just goes... Every second. Holy shit. And the town just hear this massive sort of explosion and they're looking up at, at this like now kilometers... High cloud going, what the hell is that? Winds up at high altitudes above the volcano blew the clouds southeast, which unfortunately for the Pompeians put their city directly at the center of the deluge. Whoa. So a lot of things have have gone wrong at the same time. And it's a as, lot of, of molten lava like spewing up. Yeah, right. so at and this like, time it's like sort of more ashy type that's stuff. Right, so yeah. it's you're not being burnt by it, but it is like, what the hell is that? Fuck. And how far away are they again? From They're not far. Five miles. That's not far at all. Yeah, yeah. Hoping they're reading this as a warning. Yeah. Yes. Maybe start running. You'd, you'd hope that, wouldn't you? Oh, no. Panic set in as dust and pumice began to rain down. The noise must have been absolutely incredible. Mm. Fortunately for the people being covered in it, pumice is quite a light volcanic rock. Described by Britannica as very porous, froth-like volcanic glass. It's lightweight and floats on water. It's debated, but a lot of scientists believe that the volcanic matter that initially fell on Pompeii wasn't heavy enough to kill people, but it fell at a rate of 20 centimetres per hour, so it quickly began to bury the city and cover all the roofs. Pliny the Younger wrote about people fleeing. He wrote, After weighing up the risks, they chose the open country and tied pillows over their heads with cloths for protection. That that, doesn't feel like it's going to be all that much protection. No. So a lot of people are... But I Running. honestly, first thing I'd grab is my pillow. I love my pillow. You do love your. You've brought it up <laughs> on a trip recently. We yeah, went away. Yeah, I brought a big. I brought a bigger suitcase than I needed for a three day trip. So you could take the pillow. So that one half of it was my pillow, and you know what? I was happy with that. It's a good decision. I've never done it, but yeah, that I hadn't seen it done before either. But that could be a real game changer. Love my pillow. I got a great pillow as well. I got a bad back and a bad neck. I need my pillow. My, I've got one of those pillows that's got, you can flip it yeah. depending on if you're on your side or on your back, and it's got different sort of ridges. Oh, sort good. of like a low half pipe kind of pillow. Yeah, that's good stuff. It's real good. <laughs> Dropping in in your sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I had a dream. I know dreams are so tedious, but I had a dream last night <laughs> that I had huge muscular legs. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, oh, like, I don't know what I've done. Have I, have, has this happened? The rest of you exactly the same. The rest of you basically Your legs the same. just really muscular. So I almost look like one of those half man, half beasts. <laughs> they were that muscular. Yeah, they were real. I'm like, holy shit. Wow, Fuck, like yeah. horse sick. legs. So I'm just, I was in, in my dream looking in the mirror, just flexing my legs, going, <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> this guy never skips leg there. <laughs> oh, no. Did you wake up disappointed? Yeah, did I'm you like, check your legs? Like, yeah, oh, oh, no. Oh, these little spindles. These little. <laughs> these little Pins. They're still in proportion <laughs> with the resume. <laughs> it toothpicks. sucks. Oh. Yeah, I thought I had l- <laughs> the legs of Jess for a minute. <laughs> wow. Imagine. I don't have to. So a lot of people used their muscular legs to run away, but not everyone did. Some decided to wait and see, shelter in place, as it were, oh, dear. like they did during an earthquake. They'd sat it out before and been fine. For many, this decision would cost them their lives. Oh. So people made it out if they ran... Yeah, we left early. A lot of people did did get oh, away. I didn't know that. And if you stayed and defended, you did not get away. It's hard to defend something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this isn't a bushfire. Yeah, a, a fire Which blanket also isn't going to protect you. To defend. Yeah. Over the first few hours after the eruption, material began to fall at an increasing rate. The eruption became more intense, expelling more and more magma. The falling materials increased from 1 million kilograms per second to 10 million kilograms every second. 10 million kilos every second. I can't even. No, it's I impossible can't to imagine. You can't, that, yeah. you can't imagine it. But it's a lot. I'm, all I'm just imagining is a lot. Dave, the, if I know you're going to know what question I'm about to ask, how many Olympic pools mm. full? Every pool ever. <sighs> wow. Even the ones that have been filled in. 
Holy shit, they uh, dig him out and then... Yeah. Holy and then, uh, shit. That's how big this is. The eruption column eventually reached a height of 32 kilometers into the air, which is 105,000 feet. Whoa. Holy shit. Is that what, higher than like a, a bird flies? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even a really big bird. Whoa. Like a plane? But not big bird. Okay. Who don't, doesn't, doesn't fly. fly. Little wings. Wings are too small. <laughs> not in proportion with the rest of him. Yeah. Great pins though. Poor guy. Oh yeah, great pins. Big bird's pins. a boy. I think so. There you go. All right. I mean, you know. Probably, probably doesn't Gender really is a construct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Much like the costume is a construct. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, a big bird can be whatever they want to be. I don't care. You know, I love Big Bird. I for one am glad that Big Bird wasn't there that day. I think I always thought Big Bird was a woman. Hmm. Not yeah. a girl. A woman. Or is, it, is Big Bird meant to be a kid? I have no idea. Oh, my God. How big is Big Bird going to get? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! If Big Bird's like t- six months old, holy Just a shit! Toddler bird. Oh my god, Big Bird! Big Bird will crush us all. If I Google, I'm, the- I'm doing oh, it. Great. I'm Thank doing it. What? What is the age? Oh yeah, of Big Bird. Let's have a look. Uh, Big Bird is male. Ah, oh, there you go. Um, is Big Bird a kid? Is the second thing. Big Bird is a six-year-old walking, talking yellow Holy bird. Holy shit! Standing Dave, eight right. feet two <laughs> inches. Eight feet two at six. Holy shit! It's got ten more years of growth, probably. Wow. Assuming it's sort of. Well, I don't know. Animals are a bit different, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm thinking of it like as a human. Like my dog's fully grown. He's only two. Right. Well, there you go. He's not going to get any bigger. And this is a big bird. That is a big bird. So you know how like giraffes are born pretty big, but they do get quite a lot bigger. Yeah. Anyway, Dave, back I, to um. I've also looked up the highest flying bird species on record as the endangered Ruppel's Griffin vulture. Oh, oh wow! Yeah, which I'm, flies? I might borrow that for who knew it was Matt Stewart. Ruppel's That's Griffin good, vulture. Yeah. It flies at thirty-seven thousand feet, which is the same as a coastal as a coasting commercial aeroplane. But this is one hundred and five thousand feet, so it's it's smoking all the birds. A bird's never flown this high. No, <laughs> it's higher than planes. Way higher than planes fly. Whoa. Oh, we it's, fly really high. It's so, I think it's, is it higher than a rocket's ever gone? Yes. Was this lava to the moon? This, the moon is covered in lava. Whoa. <laughs> this is getting intense. It's almost, it's like, remember how I said the Concorde was, flies super high? That's only 60,000 feet. So it's so fucking high. The whole area was blanketed in darkness. And as the column reached well, for the yeah, sky. the sun's covered in lava now. Yeah. yeah sorry, sun. <laughs> The sun got burnt out that day. <laughs> oh, no. I'm got supposed to be the hot, hot. one. <laughs> yeah. Stop her. Ow. Ow. So how do they How do they know these things? They've, they've obvi- these are obviously solid guesstimates. No one was out there with a tape measure on the day. I, it's to Who do with now they can study be? like the, where the ash flew and all that yeah, sort of the, stuff. Yeah, sort of the, the splatter zones. Yeah, the splatter zone, how thick it was. <laughs> yeah. But it's so, and based on other volcanoes of this size, it's like how they know which rows are the splash zone at SeaWorld. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know? It's only a guesstimate. Yeah. If Some of you in this zone you will get wet, and the other zones you may get wet. <laughs> That's right. Can I stress this enough? <laughs> so the whole area blanketed in darkness as the column reached for the sky. It connected the Earth with the upper atmosphere, causing continuous lightning strikes. It must have felt like the end of the world to these people who have Whoa. no idea what's going on. They've got no scientific knowledge of this. Is Are they a religious people? Yes, they've got many, many gods. So you might be thinking some version of the rapture. Yeah, a lot of people are thinking this is end of days. That's yeah. why I think a lot of people also don't leave because they're like, well, I'm sure this is happening all over Earth. Yeah, it's right. It's not just here. Yes, of yeah. course. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, where will I run? Yeah, where's... Even the, the sun is coming. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, no. The eruption kicked off around noon and by 4 p.m. Pompeii was buried in a blanket of pomace a metre deep. So then, four po- and that's a coincidence as well. Pomus and Pompeii. When was it named Pompeii? Was it before or after the Pomus? <laughs> before. Wow. Wow. What are the odds? What are the chances? But imagine that. There's a meter of like ash and this glass like rock has buried buried everything. And we know a lot about the eruption because of two of Pliny the Younger's surviving letters. In fact, they are the only first hand account of the eruption that oh, have survived. Wow. So they're very important to history. Oh, so, so he's in the bay. Trying to suppress pirates, and he looks over no, his shoulder. That's, the elder. That's, oh, his, that's that's his uncle, dad. Right, Dunkle. So, Dunkle. Wait, so this guy was there, and he was one of the fleers? No, so I'll explain where he was. So, oh, how about I let you explain? <laughs> <laughs> wait, so he was um, on a horse. <laughs> yes, Matt, do you want to take it from here? <laughs> the Matt Stewart question hour. <laughs> I'm a nightmare after half a coffee. 
<laughs> oh my god, don't finish the rest of that coffee. <laughs> so so he's written two letters. Even then, as I said before, they were they were written twenty five years later to Tacitus, oh, a famous yeah. historian who contacted his friend Pliny for his account of the eruption. So Tacitus was doing a bit of research and he said, Oh, you were close by that day. What was it like? And he wrote two letters describing it. Tacitus himself is now thought of by many to be one of the greatest Roman historians. So that's how they survived. Have you heard Tacitus quoted by uh, the great man? The great man, Dan Carlin. Yeah. It does seem like a, a Tacitus. But he would say Tacitus. Tacitus. <laughs> Quote. Unquote. <laughs> Plutarch. <laughs> right. <laughs> he lost Plutarch. The letters have been translated into English in many different ways, but this translation comes from the Cecil H. and Ida M. Green Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics. I'm, I'm I trust that. that. I, me too. I didn't do too much research, but that, they seem trustworthy. Yeah, yeah, seems legit to me. The first letter describes the journey of his uncle Pliny the Elder and is the reason that for hundreds of years people thought the date of the eruption was the 24th of August. But there's a chance he either got it wrong because it was 25 years later or the writing was hard to read and has been mistranslated over the years. I heard someone blame his scribe. Oh, no. Brutal. He's like, write this. Yep, October 24, 79 AD, and the guy's written it really quick. I've cut it down a bit, but this is most of his first letter about his uncle Pliny the Elder. He writes, At that time, and then he writes, 24th of August, AD 79, my uncle was at Mycenaeum, which is not far, well, I've added this in, which is not far around the bay from Pompeii. Okay. He's close by. In command of the fleet, because remember he's taken on pirates. Mm -hmm. About one in the afternoon, my mother pointed out a cloud with an odd size and appearance that had just formed. From that distance, it was not clear from which mountain the cloud was rising, although it was found afterwards to be Vesuvius. The cloud could be described as more like an umbrella pine than any other tree, because it rose high up in a kind of trunk and then divided off into branches. So he says it's, it's like a pine tree. Coming out of the mountain. More of a pine tree than any pine tree. Yes. <laughs> or any other tree. Right. And this is the first ever description. It feels like such a bad description of it. It's from 2000 okay, years ago. Okay, good point. So Thank you. Th- you. <laughs> and you think this is a bad description? This is the first ever description of such an eruption. And because of this, that this type of eruption is now known as a Plinian eruption. Oh. Because he's the first guy to ever describe it. Wow. <laughs> and Matt's like, what a shit description. <laughs> I was, surely it would now be known as a pine tree in eruption. <laughs> yeah. No. Amazingly not. <laughs> Another recent example of a Pliny in eruption includes my previous report topic, Mount St. Helens, when uh, it erupted yep. in 1980. You've become our explosion expert or our You're a, a volcanologist. Yeah. Thank you. Expert what am in- I? Well, you, what have you, you've got a few, you do a lot of serial killers in the past. Have so you? I'm a serial killer. Colts, maybe? Is that you? No, that's me. That's you. Um. <laughs> oh. Okay, we'll find my thing. Oh, Dolly Musicians. Parton. Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton, yeah, done- Freddie Mercury, Elton, Elton John, John. The Beatles. Yeah, okay, yeah. You might have done Bowie. I'm a musician. You did Bowie? I did Bowie. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, great. Mine's actually the coolest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mine's volcanoes. <laughs> Loser. <laughs> Lame. Lame. Loser. <laughs> Pliny continues, like a true scholar, my uncle saw at once that it deserved closer study and ordered a boat to be prepared. He said that I could go with him, but I chose to continue my studies. Nerd. <laughs> I'm a freaking nerd. A volcano is erupting and he's like, I have homework to do. <laughs> <laughs> Just as he was leaving the house, he was handed a message from Rectina, which is a great name. The wife of Tascus, whose home was at the foot of the mountain and had no way of escape except by boat. She was terrified by the threatening danger and begged him to rescue her. He changed plan at once and what had started in the spirit of scientific curiosity, he ended as a hero. He ordered the large galley to be launched and set sail. He steered bravely straight for the danger zone that everyone else was living in fear and haste, but still he kept on noting his observations. Oh, that's heroic. He's really uh, bigging up his uncle in this. Yeah. There's nothing more heroic than noting observations (laughs) in the face of possible disaster. Mm. Suddenly the sea shallowed where the shore was obstructed. Oh my God. (laughs) The sea shallowed where the shore was obstructed. Oh my God. That was, you made that sound easy. Have a go. The sea shallow where the shore was obstructed. You oh my it. god. You nailed but it. What have you Holy had... fuck. What a thrill. S- suddenly, the sea shallowed where the shore was obstructed and choked by debris from the mountain. He wondered whether to turn back as the captain advised, but decided instead to go on. Fortune favours the brave, he said. 
take me to Pomponianus. <laughs> <laughs> What is this, a Bitcoin ad? <laughs> hey, the, um, that's too much for me to remember. She said, what if it adds? And then you said, you could just keep going. Oh, I can only think I can remember all that. <laughs> you don't remember Pomponianus? Who is Pomponianus an, is fantastic. Who is an unfortunately named Roman senator, and I've only included because his name made me laugh so much. Pomponianus. I'd say fortunately named. Fortunately favours the brave and naming rights. Pomponianus. Pomponianus. Is that two names? <laughs> pump, pump. No, that's all one word. Pomponianus. Pomponianus. Beautiful name for a boy or a girl. <laughs> Could I suggest that? Even as a middle name. You know, if you're like, yeah. oh, we don't want to have a, a real, you know, look at me name. Yeah. <laughs> Pomponianus. Just bury it in the middle. I think that's Call all... him like Richard Pomponianus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perkins. <laughs> Dickie Perks. That's nice. That's nice. So he makes it to the, uh, he makes it to to shore to stay with these people, but then unfortunately for him, the wind changed because of the volcano, and they weren't able to get back into the boat because the wind was blowing to where they were rather than from, so they couldn't oh. escape. So they decided to stay the night and shelter in place. He even went to bed bravely. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> everything is bigged up. <laughs> Bravely, I went to bed at my regular bedtime. <laughs> in the face of danger, I, I put had my a cup head of on my tea pillow. and I read a book for a bit until I was quite sleepy. And then courageously, I shut my <laughs> eyelids one after the other, <laughs> as I tend to do. <laughs> and I dropped peacefully into a brave slumber. <laughs> A mighty slumber. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I face my nightmares without fear. <laughs> or reproach. <laughs> but, he, but actually, he's saying I face my nightmares without fear, but then you see him sleeping and he's going, ah, 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 <laughs> no, bats, I hate bats. <laughs> oh, my legs are so big. <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> I, I courageously cleaned the shit off the sheets the next morning. <laughs> I wasn't going to let the housekeeper have to deal with that. No, I am a man. And a man cleans up his own oh, shit. shit. <laughs> That's a bit of fun. That's a real catch-22 because a gentleman never shits. That's right, but a but man... But also a gentleman never leaves shit for other people to That's clean right. up. So It's tough, isn't it? Yeah, it's like uh, Schrodinger's shit. That's there, right. If nobody sees the gentleman shit, mm. does he shit? Well, I think in... <laughs> You know what I mean? I, lo- I think I can't remember why I started saying it. I just find it so funny when there's rules like that. Well, the gentleman never does <laughs> yeah. whatever. So it's sort of meant to be a, like yeah. a, taking that to the nth degree. But someone tweeted one at me recently. It was, a gentleman never wears gouty socks. <laughs> and it was from an old newspaper. And it was like a genuine article with these sort of quite outrageous socks. But a gentleman never does that. <laughs> I'm like, that's exactly that's exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. It's so funny. Toxic masculinity. <laughs> that's toxic masculinity. <laughs> Fuck, I don't understand anything. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, Pliny the Younger finishes his description of his uncle, saying it was daylight el- everywhere else by this time, but they were still enveloped in a darkness that was blacker and denser than any night and they were forced to light their torches and lamps. My uncle went down to the shore to see if there was any chance of escape by the sea, but the waves were still far too high. He lay down to rest on a sheet and called for drinks of water, bravely. (laughs) Then suddenly flames and a strong smell of sulfur, giving warning of yet more flames to come, forced the others to flee. He himself stood up with the support of two slaves, and then he suddenly collapsed and died, because I imagine he was suffocated when the dense fumes choked him. When light returned on the third day after the last day that he had seen, his body was found intact and uninjured, still fully clothed and looking like a man asleep than dead. What? How did they know all that? Oh, because some people did escape. Right. And they watched him die but and relayed it's, that story. Some people say he either had like a, a asthma or he was either uh, gravely unwell already and just had a heart attack because he lived a, uh, a very uh, excessive life. That was pl- Plethy? That's Pliny the Elder. Pliny the Elder. So, But does that mean is, is his nephew son uh, filling in some blanks there? Or... Yeah, he, so remember his nephew son, he's, he said to him, do you want to come with me? He said, oh, no, I'll stay here and study. Yeah. So he's safely away from the flames. So he's got the... There's, but how, does, how do people know all this stuff if the guy died and he couldn't tell his own story? Oh, because other people that were with him ha- did survive. Right, okay. Who didn't have a heart attack on the beach and <laughs> died. <laughs> bravely. Bravely. Bra- bravely. Not a bad way to go. Yes. So that's his first letter. Yeah. 
No, because then, like, you die on a beach. You know when you go to the beach and there's just sand everywhere for like a week. That's the re- that's your eternity. You'd be in, you'd be in, yeah, in heaven, presumably. Yeah, sand in sand your crack still. <laughs> oh, every time, like, oh, it's got it all, mm. but you didn't. You never had it all. It's like glitter, mm. you know, <laughs> like like the many times that we have glitter. <laughs> Not enough. So that's the first letter describing what what his uncle did, and and it ends up like changing. Uh, the name for what we call eruptions. His second letter details what Pliny the Younger himself was up to at Mycenaeum. He's 18 miles away from the volcano on the other side of the Bay of Naples. He was 17 years old at the time, but he's written this letter 25 years later. He said, Meanwhile, my mother and I had stayed at Mycenaeum. After my uncle left us, I studied, dined, and went to bed, but slept only fitfully. We had earth tremors for several days, which are not especially alarming because they happen so often in Campania. But that night they were so violent that everything felt as if it were being shaken and turned over. We were followed by a panic-stricken crowd that chose to follow someone else's judgment rather than decide anything for themselves. So they all started to flee because everyone's panicking at this point. Then we saw the sea sucked back, apparently by an earthquake, and many sea creatures were left stranded on the dry sand. And this description makes many people think that possibly a tsunami had also occurred that day. Wow. But they're not sure. Can a volcano cause a tsunami like that? Uh, yes, because of the seismic activity underneath, underneath, uh, underneath the ocean. Yeah. Holy shit! Which is crazy. It would be pretty amazing to see just an ocean empty, and all of a sudden you can just see see like sea creatures sea- just left there, going, yeah. "Oh my god, where's the water?" Yeah, that would be very surreal. He writes, "We could hear women shrieking, children crying, and men shouting." Some were called. See, call- women shriek, yes. men shout, and children cry. That's right. That all adds up. See, we're not so different, them and us. <laughs> That's right. Nothing's changed in two thousand years. What is the difference between a shriek and a shout? The, That's uh, just the, the person doing it. The pitch. Oh, okay. <laughs> so like, ah, and ah. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That's a shout. Right. That, that was a shout. That, that was, was a obviously shout. a shout. man did it. But this is a shriek. Ah! That's a shriek. Ah! Yeah, he's shrieking. Oh, oh, stop. Yeah, that's a shriek. Oh, stop it. That's a shout. Oh. Shout. Oh. That's a shout. <laughs> shriek. <laughs> Fun game. Shriek or shout. I think I'm going the hang of it. You get yeah. it? So this. Uh, is a? Shriek. Correct. This. Uh, is a? Shout. Correct. Oh, now do a cry. Uh, oh, no, that's a, what is that, a shout cry? Mm-mm. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Eee! What's that? That's a shriek. That's a shriek. <laughs> What's that? That's, that's, a, shriek. A, that's a bird dying. <laughs> <laughs> that's a sea drowning. creature that. <laughs> What's that? The sea that's swept from him. That's a mollusk. It's <laughs> <laughs> a mollusk on its last legs. <laughs> and they don't even have legs. <laughs> oh, where are my legs? <laughs> <laughs> so you're right. We could hear women shrieking, children crying, and men shouting. Some were calling for their parents, their children, or their wives, and trying to recognize them by their voices. Some people were so frightened of dying that they actually prayed for death. Does that make sense? Many begged for the help of the gods, but even more imagined that there were no gods left and that the last eternal night had fallen on the world. So I think it's the end of days. A glimmer of light returned, but we took this to be the warning of approaching fire rather than daylight. But the fires stayed some distance away. The darkness came back and ash began to fall again, this time in heavier showers. We had to get up from time to time just to shake it off, or we would have been crushed and buried under its weight. Wow. I could boast that I never expressed any fear at this time, but I was only kept going by the consolation that the whole world was perishing with me. Is that consolation, mate? Yeah. Oh, as long as everyone else is dying. <laughs> We're all in it together. Yeah, I, I love that sort of boast, though. Yeah. I don't even feel fear. I don't feel fear. I don't even sweat. After a while, the darkness paled into smoke or cloud and the real daylight returned, but the sun shone as wanely as during an eclipse. We were amazed by what we saw because everything had changed and was buried deep in ash like snow. We went back to Mycenaeum and spent an anxious night switching between hope and fear. Fear was uppermost because the earth tremors were still continuing and the hysterics still kept on making their alarming forecasts. Oh, oh, the world oh. is coming to an end. Yeah. But it sounds like a, a terrifying Trick. terrifying scene. So, But we know a lot of what it was like because of those two simple letters. Right. Oh, that's great. Wow. Luckily, someone asked the question. Yeah. Hey, man, what was it like? And then he said, oh, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. I'll fill this one. My I uncle, do a scribe to write that yeah. down. <laughs> write this down. Uncle, a hero. Me, 
never feared. Dad, yeah. uncle. <laughs> Very important that I'm, I stress. Yeah, you can imagine that he's covering something up yeah. there. Yeah, I definitely never pissed my pants. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, very defensive. I okay. didn't cry to my mummy. <laughs> All right, nobody was accusing you of that. Okay. The roofs of Pompeii began to collapse under the pressure of the pumice and ash that blanketed them. People had been evacuating and almost all of the 20,000 people in the town had left. Those that stuck around, which have commonly been estimated to be around 2,000, were met with one of the most terrifying things nature ever produces, a pyroclastic flow. Fortunately, this phenomenon is quite rare, but uh, if you're faced with it, it's terrifying. Does it happen Whoa. quickly? Like, Because people were frozen in their spots, right? Yeah, so thankfully it is quick. So when volcanoes have a Pliny in eruption, which we know comes mm-hmm. from Pliny, it's a bit like a jet engine with the power that the eruption generates keeping the whole eruption column in the air. Wow. But when the crater at the top of the volcano starts to cave in on itself, the flow of power is interrupted and the column briefly collapses. The collapsed cloud of hot gas and volcanic rock hits the ground at over 200 kilometers per hour and just starts crashing down the mountain. The gases can reach temperatures of 1,000 degrees Celsius or 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit and are the most deadly of all vo- volcanic hazards. So usually with lava doesn't flow that quickly. Usually you can usually outrun lava, but you cannot outrun a pyroclastic flow. <sighs> so so you, you can outrun lava though. In most circumstances. That is fantastic like there are, there are some times where you can't. Uh-huh. If it's really, really quick, you can at least outdrive it, for example, but you can't uh, outdrive yeah. a pyroclastic flow. Side right. note, do you think we'd be good on the show The Floor is Lava? Ooh, Ooh. I haven't seen it, but I assume yes. I Could we climb on your back and then your legs <sighs> are so strong they're f- volcanic and fireproof? I was actually going to use you. I was going to like throw you in. Oh, like grandma in uh, Dante's Peak style. Mm-hmm. Use me to paddle the boat. Yeah. <laughs> do you remember that? We've talked yes. about that before yeah, too much. Yeah. If, um, so the is I think there there should be a, like some sort of easy rhyming thing to help us, Dave, between lava and iconoclastic flow, or whatever. Pyroclastic. Because you know, like, isn't there one about if it a black if the bear is brown, stare it down? And I don't. I think it's a bullshit. No, anyway. no, that's it's if it's a bear. <laughs> you kind of stress this enough. It's a, if it's a bear. If it's if it's brown, lie down. If it's okay. black, fight back. Right. Matt's just staring it down. <laughs> yeah, come and get me, you fuck. That's a bit of a problem with these rhyming things. Other words do rhyme as well. <laughs> yeah. But is it, can you come up with a rhyme for for the lava? Okay, versus... pyroclastic flow. You got it. We, we uh, better go. Or <laughs> uh, lava flow. You're good to go. Right. That's the same fucking Fine. thing. Okay. A plastic flow. You're dead. Yeah. Pyroclastic. Oh. Uh, Ah, oh, pyroclastic flow, heaven you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> lava flow, run for your life. Ah, How about okay. that? Yeah, that's good. I love it. And black bear, you make yourself big and yell at him. Is that what you do? And brown bear, stare him down. <laughs> it's brown well, it says lie down. Do you just stay very still? Yeah, I think so. I think maybe it helps if you're if they think you're dead. Oh, they leave you alone. But hey, we don't have, have we don't have bears here, so if we're saying bad advice. Don't yeah, don't listen. Don't to act us. on us. We've only got the drop bears. Yeah, I saw someone recently talked about it and they're like, don't take that advice. That rhyme is okay. Is very... Not safe. It's not necessary. And it's hard to tell. Some like bears are of different colours and stuff and they all react differently. Right. Here we go. The rhyme could be, if it's brown, lie down. If it's black, fight back. If it's white, good night. <laughs> That's what someone written. Oh, okay. Polar bears, nothing you can do. I think there's nothing you can do. You're on your own. Or albino bears. So, pyroclastic flow. It's fast, it's hot, and there's pretty much no way to escape it. You just have to hope that by the time it reaches where you are, it's run out of energy. Wow. Doesn't make it to you. It's tired. They happen in surges, and it's been calculated that Pompeii was hit by multiple surges, each stronger than the last. First at 1am. Remember, it started at midday. This is now 1am. Then 2.15am, and then 6.30am. Thankfully, these surges only made it to the outer walls of Pompeii. So, the people who had sheltered in place, probably still okay. But for anyone who was unlucky enough to still be there for the fourth surge at 7.30 a.m., it was game over. They were almost certainly killed by the extreme heat and choked on hot ash and the dusty air that they inhaled. Right, even before the flow got to them. Well, that is the pyroclastic flow, yeah, right. So because it's gas. It's Oh, I see. Yeah. So, the la- so it's not another version of lava. No, no, it's, right. it's, it's gas and ash, basically. Right, oh, that sounds... But it's just so hot that... It's gash. It's gash. It's gash. And you... Yeah, it cooks you so quick that you die almost Hot instantly. Gash. 
A study published in the New England Journal of Medicine found that the heat was so extreme, one of the bodies that was later found had parts of its brain turned into glass. What? That is hard to fully understand. So the heat had vitrified it. Vitrification is the process by which material is burned at a high heat and cooled rapidly, turning it into glass or or a glaze. So the liquidy bit in, in the brain had been cooked so quick and then... Holy shit. And it cooled down. It became glass. When was that discovered? Uh, in the last 20 years. Wow. Whoa. Incredible. Absolutely wild stuff. These poor people fell to the ground in an attempt to shield their bodies from the burning hot wind, but it was absolutely no use. They were unfortunately killed almost instantly. Well, at least that's some consolation that it was. It would have been a very quick death. Yes. yes, rather than lingering. Yeah. Even though what at this point it's been a few days, has it? Since the no, started? so it started at midday, and this is about seven thirty the next morning. Is okay. the the knockout hit? Still, yeah, yeah, you're saying they had time to run. They had time to run, but they also had time to think about it. It's not like they true. If it was yes. just like they didn't even know it was coming, you're it right. went boom, and then it, yeah, you've yeah. had a day of sheltering, freaking out, yeah. thinking it's yeah, the end of the right. world. Yeah, you're right. It's yep. not a nice way to go. At eight a.m., a final giant flow consumed Pompeii, Herculaneum, and beyond. It caught up with some that thought they'd escaped into the countryside and the sea. This is a tragedy bit. Some people that did oh, escape. Oh, wow. Were, because it travelled 30 kilometres across the Bay of Naples. Right. You, yeah, so there's a, so a it's lesson sort of, there just to keep going. Don't stop yes, running. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Volcano. No. Don't look back. It went 30 k's into the bay. Yeah. So it sort of depended on which way the wind was going or something? Or like... Yes, that did depend on, yeah. Wow. So, yeah, you'd think, like, we're out in the water. We're fine. If there was ever a volcano in Chicago, oh, could go anywhere. Could go either way. <laughs> Windy city. <laughs> That's good stuff. And you're talking about the wind there, Jess. At 1am, a surge headed west and pummeled Herculaneum, which because of wind direction had mostly been initially spared from falling ash and debris because it had blown yeah, towards Pompeii right. and they'd gone, oh, we're actually even closer to the the mountain than everyone else but it's not blowing on us we're okay but at 1 a.m it blew back on them fortunately many of the residents had had evacuated when they saw the eruption but like its neighbors at pompeii when the flow hit those that stayed behind were instantly killed exposed to uh, 250 degree heat or 480 degrees fahrenheit which had likely killed residents within 10 kilometers including those sheltering inside buildings it was just too hot yeah like Pompeii, Herculaneum was completely buried under metres of volcanic material. In some places, it's thought to have been as deep as 20 metres. Wow. 65 feet. So completely buried. Whoa. All in all, the eruption lasted about 24 hours and ultimately released, this is mind-blowing, 100,000 times the thermal energy of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I can't get my head around that at all, but that's obviously so. Like a bombs lot that were big enough to flatten an entire city, yeah, yeah. they released a hundred, hundred thousand times that energy okay, was released. Just, I know it's what? it's unbelievable. Can you put it into Olympic pools? <laughs> no MCGs. Could you put it into oh, an MCG? MCGs? Yes. Well, uh, uh, MCG holds a hundred thousand people. Yes. This is a hundred thousand times. Okay. okay. So each person represents how much more powerful ah. the volcano uh, was yeah. than yeah, yeah, Nagasaki yeah. and Whoa. Hiroshima. Imagine like Collingwood supporters, yeah, maybe playing against Richmond. They packed it out. Packed it out. Grand wow. final or something maybe oh. when they uh, when they pack it out. Yeah, a lot of corporates in there. Yeah, you know? there's still pe- a lot of people. There's still though, people it? though. Bums in seats, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, you know whether or not they care about the game and that that maybe money's ruined what was once a great day. <laughs> yeah. So these people have died really suddenly, have they, Dave? <laughs> Really suddenly. And it's impossible to know the exact death toll, but the BBC notes the Romans were accustomed to losses mounting to tens of thousands in battle, and even they regarded this catastrophe as exceptional. Shit. I've seen many estimates, but History.com writes about 2,000 Pompeians died in the city, but the eruption in total killed up to 16,000 people in Pompeii, Herculaneum, and other towns and villages in the region. Because remember, people escaped, then they also got caught up with later. This makes it one of the most deadly volcanic eruptions in history. That's brutal to um to for the people who think they've gotten away. I know, and it just catches you. Ugh. It was normal practice to rebuild the cities of this region after even the most massive earthquakes, but neither Herculaneum nor Pompeii was reoccupied. Over the centuries, Pompeii lay underneath the meters of vo- volcanic material. Tunnelers came through and looted parts of the site, but it was never fully dug out. Looted it? Yeah, people came through and, and stole the stuff that was left behind. Because most people just left with the clothes on their back, so yeah. there was households full of possessions underneath there. But they would have all been caked in, like yeah, 
So yeah, wouldn't to... things melt or burn or? Well, some of the stuff lasted amazingly well, even for two thousand years. Wow. Underneath, if, Pl- they, if they looked hard enough, they could have found some cool glass brains. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful on, on, on a shelf. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that little conversation starter oh, for your next dinner bit party. Bit of decor. <laughs> that coffee table. That's made of brains. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <I have> to <laughs> go. <laughs> I'd start a conversation about how I need to go. <laughs> I think I left the oven on. I have to go. Bye. Bye, 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 bye. <laughs> bye. Okay, yep, 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 bye. <laughs> bye. Bye, 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 bye. <laughs> yeah, okay. See you later. Bye. <laughs> bye. Yep, 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 yep. Pliny never mentioned the towns of Herculaneum and Pompeii in his letters, so it's, de- it's debated as to whether the existence remained somewhat unknown until the late 16th century some say locals just referred to the lost city as the town or the settlement so hmm. pompeii was sort of lost to history for at least wow. a while according to archaeology world oh, yeah. which is the only world i want to be a part of <laughs> <laughs> <In 50th> <laughs> <laughs> that might be one of the lamest things you've ever said <laughs> That's the other world I want to be a part of. Okay. Archaeology world. <laughs> so awesome. My favourite theme park. <laughs> oh, yeah. Archaeology world. Woo. Every ticket comes with a free trowel. <laughs> <laughs> in 1594, workmen employed to dig a tunnel designed to divert waters of the River Sarno uncovered Roman wall paintings. They were digging in this area. They were working for architect Domenico Fontana. But the site uncovered could not at the time be identified. They were a bit like, oh, there's Roman stuff here. But we're in Italy. There's Roman stuff in lots of places. We don't know what this is. Again from Archaeology World. In 1689, an inscription was found which referred to Desurion, a town councillor of Pompeii. Even then, uncertainty remained. Many assumed that the site was the villa of a Pompeian councillor rather than the town itself because they found just the house. And they went, oh. Cool, there's a house here, but they didn't realise that everywhere around there is a whole city. Wow. More time passed, only when the Bourbon kings of the two Sicilies, Charles III, ordered the site to be excavated, did the truth emerge? Charles III? Isn't he our current king? Yes, but we we don't have a Bourbon king. (sighs) Yeah. What's he? Uh, He's more of like a... He's like a gin. I was going to say a gin. Gin king. Gin and tonic or something. Yeah. I don't know. He's probably like a... I was going to say a weak glass of water. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Just a weak glass of water, please. (laughs) Not like Dave, tall glass of water. This guy's a weak glass of water. That's why I'm a strong, tall glass of water. (laughs) Yeah, crisp. (laughs) So this was about the mid-1700s, and they found it was pretty easy to dig it out because of the light volcanic material. Around this time, the study of ancient and classical art took off across the world and became quite fashionable. Wealthy aristocrats of the time would visit the site and return home with expensive souvenirs. Glass brains. So you glass. So they kind of they're like kind of wealthy modern grave robbers. Yeah, it's okay. Like it's it's cool and classy if you're very rich. If you're already rich, That's stealing fine. is very different, you, isn't it? Yeah, Funny. I know. Then you're just an eccentric collector. Yeah, it's the same with everything, like tax evasion, or you know, like yeah. Well, yes, there's fine. welfare cheats, but if if you're poor, you're a welfare cheat. If yeah. you're rich, hey, I'm a businessman. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm working with the government. I'm creating jobs. It's was, trickling down. That's right. Where Makes you, you think, doesn't it? Rich pricks. <laughs> doesn't make you think. <laughs> I love saying things like I've thought of them. Yeah, just a little thing I've been mulling over. <laughs> wow. Is that one of yours? Yeah, that's one of mine. Here's an idea I've had. The Stuart original? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with the- I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> With the unification of Italy in 1860, the legal status of Pompeii changed from being a royal possession from which monarchs could use the site to obtain antiquities for their private collections (laughs) or gift artifacts to illustrious foreign guests to property of the state. So it became property of Italy. But before that, it had been like, yeah, yeah, you can have some of that. You're my rich friend. You can have a bit of that. But it wasn't just antiquities and treasures that were found on the site. Archaeologist Giuseppe Fiorelli was named superintendent and he began to manage the excavations in 1863. He noticed that the skeletons that were discovered at Pompeii were usually found inside hollow cavities. Buried under meters of ash and other volcanic material, the soft tissue of the body had long ago rotted away, leaving only the bones surrounded by a hollowed out shape. Wow. Where like, you know, your skin and stuff had been. He decided to pour plaster into the cavity. When the plaster was poured in, 
the bodies were seemingly brought back to life, showing an exact hollow impression of the corpse. He created the first pasta fun house. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and then kids got to go in and <laughs> paint them. They were big in the 90s, weren't they? Oh, well, yeah. I, used to, I had a, a, a crocodile from a pasta fun house for so long. Oh. Reckon I painted it when I was seven. Proudly sat on, sat on my bookshelf <laughs> or my desk or whatever in my room till I was probably an adult. <laughs> <laughs> And you'd still give it a little pat every day as you left your room. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. I love you, crocodile. <laughs> so this was pl- my best friend. <laughs> this plaster method is known as the Fiorelli method or the Fiorelli process. It was able to show a new and much more human side of the bodies, showing what they were wearing and how they looked in their final terrifying moments. Oh. And what what was his name? Giuseppe Fiorelli. That's such a great name. Incredible name. Doesn't say he's, and he was a superintendent. Sounds more like a Super Nintendo um, Mario Brothers guy. <laughs> there was a third guy, I reckon, that would, would have been called Giuseppe. Super Nintendo Giuseppe Ferrelli. Mario, Luigi, and Giuseppe. Giuseppe, yeah, you're right. <laughs> the forgotten triplet. You're right. Suck shit, Wario. Some of them, uh, the bodies are covering their faces. Some look like they're screaming out, and images of the cast fascinated people at the time, and, and it really put Pompeii on the map. Wow. Dave screaming or shrieking? Depends. It's hard to say. The women, shrieking. Yes. Men, Yelling. Yelling. (laughs) Oh, Oh, it's hot. I'll bravely yell you down, you... See, men yell, Mm. women nag. Oh. (laughs) Some of the women can be seen to be nag. (laughs) Um, You should come away from the window, please. (laughs) Uh, Whose dirty socks are these? Hmm? (laughs) Don't you want to die in clean socks? (laughs) Just left on the ground, huh? Oh, okay. The maid will pick him up, will they? Are you born in a tent, huh? <laughs> Shut the door, mate. Come on. So you can see the plaster casts of bodies as, as well as those of a pig, a cat, and a dog. Wow. And the dog's got a collar on it. Really? Yeah. They put collars on the dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best thing so far. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. A fascinating story, but they found a pig with a collar a on dog, it. A dog, <laughs> a dog with a collar on it. Okay, not quite it's as fun. It's fairly normal. <laughs> that, these days you see that all the time. All the time. Dave was saying I was very gentrified this city. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the biggest proof pigs. yet. People out walking their cats. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, by 2003, 1,044 bodies had been recovered. These days they don't, new ones don't have the... Uh, plaster injected into them. It's very much an old school thing, but they survive and they're still a very famous part of the site. So many bodies were discovered in Pompeii, but they were also made a discovery they weren't quite expecting. And that is Pompeians were horny. Very, very horny. What do you mean? Circling back to <laughs> Matt wait at the start of the episode. At the time, Rome had been a very sexualized society, but over time it had become more and more conservative. So for a city to be frozen in time during its horniest period was quite a shock to the prude Victorian era that unearthed piles and piles of erotic art. Ah. Ah. (laughs) It's all over the place. The massive wanged god Priapus was a a common good luck symbol and can be seen all over the city in frescoes, mosaics, penis-shaped wind chimes and oil lamps. Apparently his huge dick had little to do with <laughs> sex. It served to scare off thieves. Yeah. That's how big it is. It was like a club you to death with this thing. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and there were sculptures of dicks everywhere. But it wasn't about sex grow up, everyone. Depictions of the phallus could be used in gardens to encourage the production of fertile plants. Right. Sure. you got to understand. you got to. Yeah, well, it's only, we're still getting over the prude eras, aren't we? Because it used to be like, you know, it doesn't matter. Free the dick. They used free to, the dick. Free the nipple, free the dick. Back then, they didn't have to worry about that sort of stuff. It was just like, it's the body is the body. Who gives a shit? Now we're all like... And these straight jackets of clothes, I just want to rip it off. <laughs> <laughs> you right there? <laughs> Your face just did something I've never seen it do before. That was amazing. And I think really what, what I'm describing there is you finally being vulnerable with <laughs> <Yeah>. us. <laughs> and if you want to get naked, up. now's not the time. Okay. But, but you Yeah, know, because of society. That's right. And, and we're at work. So, you know. Well, this is my point. <laughs> yeah. Work and rules. Yeah, 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 true. I'm you part know? of the problem. Is this still the Victorian era? <laughs> Victorian era, more like it. There's also erotic paintings depicting uh, many sexual liaisons and orgies. But these weren't sexual. <laughs> <laughs> grow up. It's about the plants. Grow up. 
<laughs> These orgies were not sexual, okay? okay? It's about fertile gr- <laughs> land. Everyday objects such as mirrors and serving vessels were decorated with erotic scenes. So sex is everywhere you look. In 1819, when King Francis I of Naples visited the Pompeii exhibition with his wife and daughter, he was embarrassed by the erotic <laughs> artwork and ordered it to be locked away in a secret cabinet. Oh, yes, that only he had <laughs> yeah, the keys to. Accessible to only to people <laughs> of mature age and respected morals and also only men. He was embarrassed that he got a stiffy. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> Known as Gabinetto Segreto, the secret museum or secret cabinet. It was reopened, then closed, then reopened again, then closed again, with the entranceway being bricked up in 1849. It was too hot to handle this stuff. Wow. It was off limits for nearly 100 years. What? The secret room was briefly made accessible again at the end of the 60s, before finally being reopened in the year 2000. Since 2005, the collection has been kept in a separate room in the Naples National Archaeological Museum. I'm spewing I didn't go. One of the most famous pieces in the collection is a statue of what looks like a devil-like creature fucking a goat. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That is hot. And Dave's disappointed he didn't get <laughs> to see that. I didn't get that. to go. It's, it's what is, I can't funny. even picture it. What would it look like? <laughs> I'd love to know. Oh, please. Let me in. <laughs> <laughs> Banging on the bricked up door. Let I'm of in. mature age and a man. <laughs> so far, it's estimated that only two thirds of Pompeii has been excavated. So who knows what they'll find over the coming decades. Ooh. Maybe more dicks. Wow. Wow, more orgies depicted. And just to finish up, the threat of Vesuvius has not gone away over the millennia. In fact, in the last 2,000 years, it has erupted about 30 more times. Really? Starting in 1631, Vesuvius entered a period of steady volcanic activity, including lava flows and eruptions of ash and mud. Violent eruptions in the late 1700s, 1800s and early 1900s created more fissures, lava flows and ash and gas explosions. These damaged or destroyed many towns around the volcano and sometimes killed people. The eruption of 1906 had 100 casualties. The most recent eruption was in 1944 during World War II. It caused major problems for the newly arrived Allied forces in Italy when ash and rock from the eruption destroyed planes and forced evacuations at a nearby airbase. So it erupted not that long ago, which is probably a good thing because you want it to be steady, small eruptions rather than hundreds right. of years of nothing. Yeah. Have, have scientists tried to like... Um manipulate it at all or they're just letting it do what it does well it's closely monitored by scientists thankfully these days so hopefully next time it erupts everyone will be able to escape right a safely. Pierce Brosnan type that's right Pierce Brosnan and his grandmother today Vesuvius is the only active volcano in mainland Europe although there are others on islands in nearby Sicily and Santorini and has produced some of the continent's largest volcanic eruptions it is regarded as one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world because of the population of 3 million people living near that would probably oh, be affected wow. by an eruption, with 600,000 in the danger zone. Holy shit. Making it the most densely populated volcanic region in the world. Oh. That's, uh, I always think it's wild. People, you know, like just on the outskirts of Melbourne, real bushfire prone areas yeah. where people live there and it's just their life. Yeah. They just know every summer. There's a chance their house might burn down. Yeah. They've got a plan. And yeah. It's all worked out. Yeah. So, somehow it feels even more full on to be living, even though it's less likely to happen and it's not every year, but it could be any time. Yeah, exactly. And it could be big. They don't know. Mm. These things are difficult to predict. Uh, the destruction of Pompeii has been the basis for paintings, poems, TV shows, movies, songs, and books. Pink Floyd filmed a famous music special in the amphitheater there in the 1970s, which is pretty cool. Wow. That's awesome. It's fascinated people for centuries. And at this point, it's been the longest continually excavated site ever found. And I'm sure it will continue for decades and centuries to come. That's such a funny record to have. The longest continuously excavated site. Yeah. People just, for over 300 years, they've just, just been digging out bit by bit. Non-stop. Is there a queue there? Discovering new stuff. I think for a while there, they decided to back off on discovering, on digging out new stuff and conserving what they do have because UNESCO designated it uh, like in danger of being... Overdug. Overdug and also the fact that I think it's one of Italy's most visited tourist attractions. Did you see? How- yeah, you can you can walk through it. It's amazing. And you did all that? Yeah, you walked through. God, it was hot though, but it was fantastic. Yeah, it's really really cool. I don't, think, I don't think you get to complain about how hot it was. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Ooh, a bit Ooh. hot for me. Well, like 38 High degrees. 30s, yeah. yeah. You're oh, walking you poor past thing. the corpses. Of people oh. who died instantly at, In from a, from the, at the how hot gas was, yeah, I, and I, you're I, like bloody hell, that sun. 
Yeah, fair call. Yeah. Fair call. <laughs> At first, I thought you meant it was hot as in sexy, sexy hot because you saw a dick. Oh, and there are some, you know, there is inside, they've got like a, a cooled part of the exhibit where you go in, which was lovely. Um, which <laughs> they, they would have loved it. They would love some air conditioning. Out there. And they have a lot of erotic erotic art. Yeah. Were you at the photo you posted around that time when you're over there and you look like a character from <laughs> Poirot? Poirot. I will be Were posting, you wearing that? I'm wearing, that outfit, I am wearing that outfit because Qantas had lost all our baggage and I had to. Uh, Basically, wear what I could buy in a small Italian town. <laughs> so I'll be posting. A, I'll be posting a photo of myself there with the uh, famous Vesuvius in the background, and it's right there, it looms over you. So if wow. that was erupting, I can you can imagine how terrified they would have been. One day we should do like Led Zeppelin. We should do a live podcast <laughs> there. What do you think? I think that's a great plan. Hmm. Maybe. I, I'd love imagine to do if that. we could time it with an eruption. <laughs> That'd be sick. That'd be ab- absolutely the sickest thing ever. We said, oh, we'll see you next week. Goodbye, erupt. <laughs> yes. Yeah, And we all run. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all run in, uh, into the danger zone. Uh, but that's my report. That's the final episode of Block wow. 2022. Wow. How about a round of applause for Block? Block, 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 Block. Kiss, 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 kiss. Oh, Block, <laughs> you're so sexy. <laughs> well done, Dave. That was awesome, Dave. What oh, a story. I'm so glad to have heard that tale told. Mm. <laughs> Finally, I was able to report on it. Very happy. <laughs> wow. I can't believe Block is over. Um, Dave, how are you feeling? Well... I feel like it ain't over till it's over. There's still more to go. That's true. We're still blocking it out. Uh, Jess, unfortunately, didn't realise that, and she's left. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we went, hang on, Jess. Oh, oh okay. okay. Well, I guess we'll be talking to our Patreon supporters then. Uh, and the beauty of block, as opposed to other um, festive seasons like Christmas, after Christmas, it's a nearly a full 12 months till it's Christmas again. Right? That's right. Less exactly. one day. Yeah. Whereas block... It's only 10 months till the next block. That's nothing. Isn't that a beautiful part of block? About 300 odd days, 300 sleeps till the next block. And you can just keep listening to these nine episodes from block 2022 until next block. Or check out a couple of the previous blocks. Some people live like it's Christmas every day. You can live like it's block every day. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But we, at the end of the show, love to thank some of our great supporters. Uh, Without them, this show would not exist. And if you want to be involved there with them... You can do so by signing up at patreon.com slash do go on pod. And there's a bunch of different rewards you can get there, Dave, including what are some of the things there? We put out three bonus episodes every single month. And as soon as you sign up, you get access to the back catalog. And that's over 150 bonus episodes at this point. So cool. So that's one level, but there's also other different levels where you can vote for topics, decide what the show's going to be about, join the Patreon group on any single level, and it's a lovely, lovely place to be. You're, on any level, you also get to uh, write the questions for Who Knew It with Matt Stewart now, my new comedy quiz show. So uh, all if you listen to that show, you'll know there's seven questions every week, and they're all... Uh, written by you fabulous Patreon supporters. And a great job they do. They do a fantastic job. Um, but the first thing we normally like to do in this section of the show is uh, the fact, quote, or question section, which I think has a jingle go something like this. Fact, quote, or question. Ding, 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 ding. You remember the ding, ding, ding and the jing, jing, jingle, and uh, which is very appropriate. As we end block, we are coming into the festive Krishmish time of year. Absolutely. Another beautiful time of year. Second greatest time. The jingle bells are ring, ding, dingling all of a sudden. Um, but in this section of the show, people on the Sydney Scheinberg level of our Patreon get to give us a fact, a quote, or a question, or a brag, or a suggestion. Oh, or a recipe. Whatever they freaking well like, it is up to them. They get carte blanche. <laughs> Am I saying that right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, and uh, this week, we have some fantastic facts, some fantastic quotes, some fantastic questions, and a brag in there as well uh, as I look down the list. The first one comes from Tessa Chilcott. Uh, who's given herself the title of Director of Moving Furniture Around the House for Short Periods to see <laughs> how it looks there. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, Jess will tell you that she recently moved her dining table, flipped it over, hasn't looked back. How good does her dining room look now? Oh, game changer. Oh, my goodness. So much more room for podcasting, <laughs> yeah. as is the most important use of a dining table. And uh, Tessa has offered a fact this week, writing, Elephants can recognize themselves in the mirror. And mirror. The mirror. <laughs> oh, mirror selfie. <laughs> Amazing, Tessa says. I can barely do this sometimes myself. They join humans, apes, and dolphins. And of course, humans are apes, but you know, I don't want to. I'm actually <laughs> there, Tessa, but I also host a podcast called Primates about primates. Yeah. And uh, yeah. <laughs> You're well within your rights. <laughs> uh, 
And their closest living relative is the Hyrax. Seriously, look it up. It is insane that this is the closest to an elephant. I've never heard of a th- th- Hyrax. Have you heard of a Hyrax, Dave? No, that's their closest living... Closest living relative. Uh, Tessa finishes by saying, Anywho, thanks for the laughs. You're an amazing bunch. Hey, Tessa, right back at you. I've never heard of a Hyrax. H-Y-R-A-X. What is a Hyrax? Oh, they're like a little... They look like a little marsupial or something. Yeah, they're very small. They're a rock rabbit. <laughs> That's fun. How could they? How can they possibly be related to elephants? It says they're closely related to elephants and sea cows. What is it? What is going on? This feels like we're in an alternative universe where these things exist. Yeah, I've never heard of a hyrax or a sea cow. Sea cow, Sirenia. There's two families of which one of which is uh, the dugong. Right, okay. I've heard of a dugong. And then this, the now extinct Stella's sea cow. But these animals are all completely different. A dugong, a little rock rabbit, and an elephant. Amazing. And are you, have you confirmed that? Close, closest relative to an elephant? Yeah, I'm, I just Googled it saying rock hyrax. I, I can't get my head around that. That is a wild fact. Tessa, you've outdone yourself. Thank you so much. That's great. I mean, they're between two and five kilos. How many is an elephant? Yeah. At least double that. Yeah, at least. Possibly double and a half. The next one comes from Nathan Swap. Okay, Wizards Cartwright, in brackets. <laughs> in brackets, it will make sense, close brackets. <laughs> Good. Uh, Nathan's got a question, which reads, What is an item or prop from a film that you love and would like to own? Ooh. Uh, Nathan has answered his own question, saying, In the first Lord of the Rings movie, the wizard Gandalf arrives to the Shire in a two-wheel horse and drawn cart. Or just two-wheel horse-drawn cart. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. It looks so well built and cozy. I would love to travel around through forests and fields in it wearing a big pointy hat while smoking a pipe. That sounds like a dream. Yes. I mean, I love that. That's a that's a real uh, elaborate prop or item. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know. What do, what do you think, Dave? Anything coming to mind? I've seen like replicas online for sale of you know, in The Mummy, fantastic Brenda Fraser movie that we all love. Mm. There's, uh, they've got the Book of the Dead that they only open with a key, which is that thing that sort of like clasps open. Like it looks like a little box and then it opens up and then that turns out to be a key. Do you remember that? That little metal thing in the movie? Yes. And it, you know, it looks yeah, like a beautiful. star when it's split out. I th- I've seen people have replicas of that for sale online. I think that's a very cool little thing. I think if I could choose anything at all, and that one's already been taken, I'll, get, I'll go with my second pick, uh, which is the Ford XB Falcon hardtop. Uh, featured in Eric Banner's 2009 documentary film, Love the Beast. Love the Beast, of course. A beautiful automobile. And uh, it'd be, it's very close to my dream car. Probably technically would like the XC, the next model, but very would be very happy with, happy with that. I'd also be happy with the mansion from the Adams family. <laughs> kind of cool. Do you get, would you get Thing and Cousin yeah. It and everyone? Cousin It, Lurch. You rang. You rang. Oh, you you perfect lurch. Give me the roll. Get him in there, everyone. Get me in. Get him in. <laughs> you could, oh, you'd destroy lurch. Be Uncle Festa. I feel like you do a great Festa. <laughs> <laughs> I love Uncle Festa. Uncle Festa's te- great. You in- were cart- uh, not cartoon, but the live action show. Loved it so much as a yeah, kid. Yeah, fantastic work. Didn't, um, was it Doc from Back to the Future played Festa in the 90s films? Oh, did he? I think. That's a vague memory I have. Christopher Plummer? <laughs> no. <laughs> Christopher Plummer is... It's Christopher Lloyd. Christopher Lloyd. <laughs> Christopher Plummer's the dad from Sound of Music, I think. Thank you. He'd also make a great Uncle Fester in his old age. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Get him in there. I mean... Christopher <laughs> Lloyd, fucking hell. You, sometimes you take a punt and you're like, that's. I think that's that guy's name. I, but the funny thing is, you could be right. Maybe that's who did play it. No, it was Christopher Lloyd. <sighs> Imagine if it was Christopher Oh, Palmer. man, that would have been fantastic. He would have been a good... Christopher Lloyd's so funny. Um, Great question. Thank you very much, Nathan Swap. Uh, I think Dave gave you probably more of an answer that you were looking for than me. I, I just couldn't think. The first thing I thought of was... That beautiful automobile. I mean, if they were real, a lightsaber would be fucking cool. Yeah, that's true. Just go, cut, cut through, toast. Oh, imagine! I think you could say that in this yeah. in this world here. In this, uh, the next one this week comes from Drew Forsberg, aka Viscount of Five Finger Dis. <laughs> Viscount of Five Finger Discount. That's real good <laughs> that's stuff, good. Drew. And Drew's got a brag. 
can only assume this brag is going to be about him stealing something. Let's read. Okay, it's related to a brag because I'm proud. I thought of it. Here goes. Did you hear about the fella who was distraught over the limited scope of his out-of-body experience? He was just beside himself. <laughs> <laughs> Says, cheers from God's country. <laughs> Keep up the brilliant work. Hey, you too, Drew. Did you hear about the fella who was distraught over the limited <laughs> scope of his out-of-body experience? He was beside himself. <laughs> Any joke that features the phrase limited scope is very <laughs> funny. <laughs> and finally, this week, this comes from Sophie Choo Choo Tudor. So I'm guessing, is that Sophie telling us that it is Tudor, not Shooter? Because you corrected me saying it was yes, Shooter. You wouldn't say Sophie Choo Choo Shooter, would you? Mm-hmm. Or is she buying into the gag? I don't know, I Sophie. Don't know. Sophie, I'm so sorry. Uh, but Sophie writes, her title is Group Mum. Jess, finish your homework. Well, then maybe that's where she rushed off to. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Jess, uh, sorry, Sophie is offering a suggestion. Jeez, we got all f- four of the different options in one week. Love it. Collect them all. Sophie writes, may I suggest at some point today, you take five minutes to yourself. Take three big breaths in. Let's do it now, Dave. Out. In. Out. In. Out. Not in. In, in, out, out, out. <laughs> not <Okay>. in. Not, <laughs> I guess. Okay. Uh, that was, it. yeah. Okay. Close your eyes, relax your shoulders, and let out a big, deep, long fart. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do whatever she said. <sighs> Dave, Dave can't even fart on command. Damn it. What a loser. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Sophie, Drew, Nathan, and Tessa for these great facts, quotes, and questions. If you are on the Sydney Scheinberg level, don't forget to get them in. Some people get them in really frequently, including, I think, the four people we read out today. Yeah. Some people very sporadically. So stop what you're doing right now. Go give us a fact, quote, or question. It could be whatever you like. doesn't matter. It could be telling us to fuck. That's right. Get them in and then let them out. <laughs> let it out. Uh, but we appreciate all those great people. I'll be taking that advice later on, Sophie. I'll be doing it every day. Uh, the other thing we like to do is thank a few of our other great supporters. Jess normally comes up with a bit of a game based on the topic at hand, Dave. That responsibility falls to you. What should we do with these people here today? What about what they were doing when the eruption started? Oh, okay, great. And we're talking about the volcano eruption. The volcano. Can I serious. ask you, uh, and I hope you've done this so it's a bit confusing my request, but can you take out a lot of the sexual stuff I said in this episode? Well, edit. if people are hearing this and it doesn't make sense, you've I've done what you want. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> well, can, maybe I'll kick us off. I'll do the first five. You do the second four. Because we normally do three. Okay, yeah, okay great. Uh, first off, I would love, if I may, to thank from Coon, Oregon, in the Australian Capital Territory. I'd love to thank Mac Noble. Mac Noble. What about Mac Noble was doing a magic show? Oh yeah. And then for a couple of seconds, thought, oh, shit, have I done this? <laughs> oh, no. I've summoned the beast. Oh, no. So I've he's frozen in time with a rabbit halfway out of a hat. <laughs> yeah, going, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, that's great. And Noble. Mark, Mac, Mac Noble's a pretty good magician. Yeah. I reckon. Please welcome Mac Noble. The magnificent Mac Noble. Oh, that's good. I'd also love to thank from Austin, Texas, stay weird or <laughs> remain weird or whatever it is, Alex Hill. Dave, Alex, Alex Hill, up Hill Alex Hill, uh, Alex Hill was um, baking pies. Oh yeah, and annoyingly for Alex, they'd realised shit. I miscounted. Five people are at home. I've only got four, and they were freaking about out what to do, what to do. Then the eruption started. They thought, yes, I've gotten out of it. <laughs> yeah, no one's going to be noticing this at, anymore. At first, he's like, oh, what did temperature did I set the oven to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. And then, hang on, we're all going to be horribly killed. Oh, this is thank great. God. I've only got four pies for five people. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. I'd also love to thank from Kiraville, also in the Australian Capital Territory, Zach Arkley Smith. Zach Arkley Smith. As always, fantastic name. Uh, Zach had just finished mowing oh, the front lawn. What a waste. What of time. a waste. <laughs> Sorry, Zach. Shit. Yeah. I mean, and depending on. How long the grass was? I don't know for sure, but maybe that could have blocked out the lava. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your fine work, Zach. Uh, may I thank from Inverness, 
in Great Britain. His Inverness would be in Scotland. That's in Scotland, absolutely. I would love to thank Jordan Taylor. Jordan Taylor. Not Thomas. Drop the Thomas. I can only assume this is JTT. Oh, Jordan Taylor Thomas. I forgot, absolutely, going under the radar. Oh, my God. Jordan Taylor Thomas. <laughs> he dropped the Taylor. <laughs> he dropped the Thomas and added the Auden. Yeah. And awesome. also dropped the... <laughs> <laughs> the Onathan. <laughs> they kept only that very specific name, <laughs> Taylor. <laughs> Jordan Taylor. Thomas? Could it be? Could it be? <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> yeah, nice try. Yeah, you're hiding in plain sight there, JTT. JTT. What did uh, JT, what was uh, he up to? JT was uh, actually playing kick to kick in the park with the, their child. Yep. Aussie rules in Scotland? I love yeah, that. Aussie rules. But this is in Pompeii. This is a Scottish person in Pompeii. Oh, of course. Playing Aussie rules. It's Jack a, in the pack. The, the, the real global game. Yes. So you, you kick it. Um, and honestly, Jordan was a bit like, oh, I'm actually a bit bored of this, but the kids wants to keep playing. He does Oz kick. Yeah, like, he oh, wants okay, to keep practicing. Okay, all right. You know, An hour, is this enough? The eruption starts again. Jordan's off the hook. They've got to run for their lives. And he, uh, Jordan purposely left the footy. Uh, to be uh, covered in pyroclastic flow, so didn't have to even worry about playing kick to kick wherever they ran to. Fantastic work there, George. Got away with it. And finally, from me, I'd love to thank from, I want to say, Hal. Is that how you pronounce a word like that, Dave? In I, maybe Belgium? Hal in Belgium, that's pretty cool. I'm sure we're saying it wrong, but hey. I'd love to thank Alison M. Hal in Belgium. It is a city in Belgium, looking it up. Does it give you a pronounce there? No, it's a small uh, population of 31,000. Not far from Waterloo. 31,000, not far from the population of uh, the place we talked about today, Pompeii. Pompeii, which is where Alison M was during the eruption, obviously. And Alison M had just finished doing a news cross. Alison, of course, being a local reporter, live on TV. It finishes, and they'd just done a very boring, like, cooking segment. Nothing interesting happened. The director had yelled, cut, we're out. And then the eruption started and they thought, fuck, we've just missed. Oh, God. We've missed our moment. Damn it. Sorry, Alison. Get the cameras rolling. Oh, no, they're gone. Yeah, but they, I mean, so they're like, oh, we never got to capture this moment on camera for posterity. But they were actually just captured exactly what they were doing. Yeah, exactly. The moment frozen in time forever. There's a, yeah, someone holding a camera. Uh, in 2018, I didn't mention this in the, the report, but... um. A video sort of went, sorry, a photo went viral of a, a skeleton in Pompeii and then there was a big rock over the skull and it looked like the person had been absolutely killed. <laughs> I'll show you. By a boulder. This. By a boulder. It just looked like the boulder had just landed oh, on their wow. head. But, and then it went viral. People thought it was very funny. You know, people have, have They a, thought that was funny. Yes, people had a lot of fun with it. That's so weird. Um, But it did, turned out that they weren't crushed by the stone. It just looked like that. So, but yeah. Oh, well, fun spoiler. The internet went wild with this thing. Ah, I missed that. I obviously had a day off the internet that day. Dave, would you like to thank a few of our hey, great I supporters? I would love to thank um, from Manasha in WI. Where's WI? Uh, Wisconsin. It is Wisconsin. Well done. It's uh, from Manasha. It's Sam Demol. Sam Demol. Sam Demel, unfortunately, was just filling up their diesel engine oh, with unleaded. Oh. So, yeah, their last moments were go, going, oh, shit. Who it was a I higher call? car. They weren't used to it. Oh, no. And they were about to um, siphon out the the unleaded to, to start suck it again. Out. They're going to suck it out. So what a way to go. <laughs> Frozen in time forever. Sucking out. Sucking suck it off out. a car. Oh, no. Yeah. Sam. So that's a shame. So I wanted to do it. I would like to thank now from uh, Carlisle in Illinois in the United States. It's Nikita Pruitt. Nikita Pruitt was picking uh, some fruit off the tree. An apple tree. Oh. So up on tippy toes on a ladder. <laughs> Frozen in time, on a ladder, on tippy toes, the tree, the apple, it just was, it's magnificent. Um, I think a rich person from a few hundred years ago now has it in their courtyard. Oh, fantastic. The whole scene. That's right. Oh, I'd like to buy this scene. Yes. Uh, but it was a magnificent scene. You can picture it, little step ladder, 
tippy toes, just plucking off the perfect apple. Oh, beautiful. Dangling off off a high branch. Not not going for any low fruit. Going for a, a high fruit. High fruit. Wow, the higher up the fruit, the better the, the fruit. You knew it. <laughs> I would like to thank also from Brunswick West here in Victoria, Jessica Hewitson. Jessica Hewitson was, of course, uh, one of the great, 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 great ancestors of Ian Huey Hewitson. Oh. Uh, even though the names, I think, are spelt differently, but uh, that's what happens over time. Huey, Language of course, evolves. a famous TV chef. Yes. Uh, and he uh, obviously was a big cook, but he got all of that from Jessica's genes. And Jessica was cooking up a strudel at the time. Uh, she oh, was she was working wow. with Nikita and expecting a delivery of fresh apples from Nikita at the time. <laughs> um, she was waiting. So she's frozen in time looking at her wristwatch. Uh, of course, at the time, wristwatches were not invented, but she did come up with the joke, what's the time? It's a hair past a freckle, which is a classic bit. Uh, what a great joke that is. <laughs> Stand- yeah. It, it, do, it doesn't seem that funny now, but back then in 79 AD... Oh, that's, this is killing. It was That was cutting edge humour. Uh, well done, Jessica, and thank you so much for your support. And finally, I'd like to thank from oh, beautiful sounding place, Pleasanton. Pleasanton in California, George Pascoe. George Pascoe was just settling down to a romantic bath. Uh, had just lit the 200th candle in his uh, surrounding his bathroom on the floor on the shelves everywhere and uh was just about to settle into the bath when it hit so did all the prep work but didn't get to enjoy the relaxing scented candles for long unfortunately but uh i mean like most of life a lot of the joy is found in the anticipation and george did get to enjoy that anticipation absolutely forever forever (laughs) he was stuck in that beautiful spot of dipping your toe into <laughs> the spa bar beautiful thank you so much to george jessica nikita sam allison jordan zach alex and mac we appreciate your support so much i don't think i can even put it into words so i won't bother trying dave can you i love you yeah that's ba- that's basically it really that's should have been able to find those words yeah, come on mate sometimes love is the hardest word to say or is that sorry <laughs> uh, and that brings us to our final section of the show where we welcome in a our Triptych Club members, our new members in the Triptych Club. Only one inductee this week, Dave. Uh, the way this works is if you're on the shout-out level or above for three straight years, you get welcomed into the club. It's a bit of theatre of the mind. The club is ever-expanding every week. And uh, Dave normally books a band for the after party. Dave also MCs the show. Oh, He's yeah. hyping up the crowd as we speak. They're all in there, all the previous inductees he's hyping them up they're so sick of me i'm there every night (laughs) get someone else and uh jess is normally behind the bar but she's got an rdo this week so i'm jumping in behind the bar as well and uh she normally has a cocktail named after the topic uh this week the the pompeii what would a pompeii cocktail be i feel like it'd be it'd be hot it'd be hot it's one of those lit ones so maybe it includes what where's pompeii and what's an italian spirit frangelico is that Italian? Yeah, or like um, Cenzino. Cenz- it's Cenzino and Frangelico. <laughs> and if they're not flammable, a flammable uh, liqueur. And they're mixing together, lit on fire. Uh, and you get to enjoy those. Don't forget to breathe in those toxic hot Mm-mm-mm. gases. Yes, that authentic Pompeii flavor. It's Cinzano. Sorry, everyone. I don't mean for you to yell yeah, at your eyes. Vabene, vabene, vabene. Vabene, vabene. You vabene, know what I mean. Vabene, vabene. Uh, and Dave, you normally book a band for the after party. Who have you got this week? You're never going to believe it. I obviously booked these months, months out because these all these high profile acts have big tours and stuff. But we've actually got the band Bastille, famous for their hit song Pompeii. Oh, Pompeii. Mm-mm. Is that a big song? Yeah, yeah, about ten years ago. They're an English band. Yeah, so right. They're sort of like pop rock stuff. Great, fantastic stuff. That'll really that'll get the crowd going. Absolutely. So just one un- inductee this week. Uh, please make them welcome Dave from Hawthorne in California in the United States. It's Michelle. Michelle. Not much to work with here. My bell. Michelle, my bell. Uh, I will sell my soul to welcome you. You know, Hawthorne in my side, uh, <laughs> you are now a rose between two thorns. Does that mean you? 
I think we're the thorns. Okay. And uh, <laughs> California, here, here we come. Do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, Bastille, start playing. Thanks, Bastille. Appreciate that. Uh, welcome in, Michelle. Make yourself at home. Really do appreciate it very much. Uh, that's really all we need to do. And that closes up block once and for all. Really, I just want it to keep going on forever. But Dave, we really should let people move on with their lives. We really, really should. But in the meantime, if they want to get in contact with us, they can hit up our website, dogoonpod.com, with links to Patreon, merchandise, both two great ways to support the show as well as tickets to our live shows. You can get in contact with us, dogoonpod at gmail.com. And we're on social media, dogoonpod. Jump on board. And check out all our other podcasts. If you're uh, up to date with Do Go On, there's Book Cheat, which there's uh, nearly 100 or more than 100. Yeah, closing in, I think we're you know, 70 something of them. So uh, Dave does a, a show where he, uh, it's basically Do Go On, but instead of uh, historical stories, they're fictional stories uh, from classic novels. Uh, I've also started a new podcast called Who Knew It with Matt Stewart. It's a comedy quiz, kind of based around the old, olden days game. <laughs> When my mum was a kid, I think of that as the old days, uh, called Dictionary. So it's a game of bluff. It's a quiz, but the guests also um, help write the questions. Um, we call it the uh, quiz where the guests write the wrong answers. That tagline was suggested by a Patreon. I wish I could remember who it was so I could um, send them a bouquet. Oh, that'd be lovely. Um, that was a bluff. That's uh, all part <laughs> of the game. Ah. There's also Primates, which is an, uh, a show where we talk about primates and popular culture. Done recent episodes about movies like Nope and uh, the Hit Monkey series on Disney Plus and all, all such things like that. So check out all those shows as well. A lot of fun to be had. A lot of fun to be had. All right, Dave. Want to boot this baby home? Hey, we'll be back next week with another episode. It won't be block anymore, but it will be a great episode. I can assure you of that. The quality will not drop. We never drop the quality. We never drop the quality. And we'll be back with another episode then. But until then, I'll say thank you so much and goodbye. Laters. Thank you.